The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This is our second hearing on facial recognition technology. I now recognize myself for five minutes to make an opening statement. Today, the committee is holding our second hearing on the use of racial, facial recognition technology. And we will be examining the use of this technology by law enforcement agencies across the federal government. We had a broad survey of full range of issues raised by technology. We heard from a number of experts about the benefits and the dangers uh, of this technology across government and the entire private sector. Star conclusion after our last hearing was that this technology is evolving extremely rapidly without any really safeguards. Whether we are talking about the commercial use or government use, there are real concerns about the risks that this technology poses to our civil rights and liberties and our right to privacy. The other conclusion from our last hearing was that these concerns are indeed bipartisan. As we saw at our last hearing, among conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, this is a wide range agreement that we should be conducting oversight of this issue to develop common sense, concrete proposals in this area. And I truly appreciate the ranking member's commitment to working together on this issue again in a bipartisan way. Today, we will focus on the use of facial recognition technology by our government. Our committee has broad jurisdiction over all government agencies. So we are uniquely situated to review how different agencies are using this technology on the American people. For example, today we will hear from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In April, the Government Accountability Office sent a letter to the Department of Justice with open recommendations on the FBI's use of facial recognition technology. As that letter stated, the FBI had not implemented these recommendations despite the fact that GAO initially made them three years ago. We also hear from GAO, not only on the importance of these recommendations, which focus on transparency and accuracy, but also on the dangers associated with failing to implement them. We will also hear from the Transportation Security Administration, which has launched pilot programs in U.S. airports that subject uh, American citizens to a facial recognition system. Finally, we will uh, hear from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, or NIST. NIST has been the standard bearer for biometric accuracy for the past 20 years. NIST will discuss the state of the technology, the rapid advancement of this technology, accuracy challenges this technology still faces, and future plans for testing and monitoring progress. Hearing from all of these relevant actors uh, and building this record of information is important as we begin to stress the use of facial recognition technology by both government and private actors and potentially develop legislative solutions. We will continue to hear from additional stakeholders through our subcommittees, each of which is tasked with a specialized focus, such as safeguarding the civil rights and liberties, protecting consumers, examining our government's acquisition of this technology, 
and reviewing national security concerns. I anxiously look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today. And now, with that, I recognize the distinguished member, the distinguished ranking member of our committee, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, thank I mean it. Thank you for this hearing. Uh, we, we fight a lot on this committee, and I, I, I think we may have a little vigorous debate tomorrow morning. But um, today is a subject matter where um, we have a lot of agreement and a lot of common ground. And so I genuinely appreciate the Chairman's willingness to uh, have a second hearing on this important subject. Um, two weeks ago, we learned some important things. Facial recognition technology, uh, there are all kinds of mistakes made when it's implemented. Those mistakes disproportionately impact African Americans. There are First Amendment, Fourth Amendment concerns when it's used by the FBI and the federal government. There are due process concerns when it's used by the FBI and the federal government. We learned that over 20 states 20 states have given their Bureau of Motor Vehicles, Department of Motor Vehicles, the, the database, driver's license database, they've just given access to that to the FBI. No individual signed off on that when they renewed their driver's license, got their driver, they didn't sign any waiver saying, oh, it's okay to turn my information, my photo over to the FBI. No elected officials voted to allow that to happen. No state assemblies, no general assemblies. No bills, no governor signing something, passing a bill to say it's okay for the FBI to have this information. And now we learn that when GAO did a, their investigation and study into how the FBI implemented this, there were all kinds of mistakes the FBI made and how it was implemented. I think five recommendations that GAO said you're supposed to follow that the FBI didn't follow. And all this happened. Oh, and it's been three years for some of those that they still haven't corrected and, and fix those concerns that GAO raised with the implementation of facial recognition technology. And all this happens, all this happens in a country with 50 million surveillance cameras. So this is an important subject. And I, again, appreciate the chairman's willingness to have a second hearing and willingness to work together in a bipartisan fashion to figure out what we can do to safeguard American citizens' First Amendment and Fourth Amendment and due process rights as we uh, as we go forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. I now want to welcome our witnesses. Ms. Kimberly J. DeGreco is the Deputy Assistant Director of Criminal Justice Information Services at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Dr. Greta Goodwin is the Director of Homeland Security and, and Justice at the United States Government Accountability Office. Dr. Charles Romine is the director of the Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And Mr. Austin Gold is the assistant administrator of uh, requirements and capabilities analysis at the Transportation Security Administration. If you would please raise, stand and raise your right hand, and I will swear you all in. Do you swear or affirm that the uh, testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you very much. You may be seated. The microphones are very sensitive, so please speak directly into them. Make sure they're on when you speak, please. Without objection, your written statements will be made a part of the official record of this committee. With that, uh, Director Del Greco, you're now uh, considered for recognized to give you your statement for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cummings and Ranking Member Jordan and the members of the committee. My name is Kimberly Del Greco. I am the Deputy Assistant Director leading the Information Services Branch with the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services Division. Thank you for the opportunity to be appear before the committee. I am testifying today regarding the FBI's use of facial recognition for law enforcement purpose. It is crucial that authorized members of law enforcement and national security communities have access to today's biometric technologies to investigate, identify, apprehend, and prosecute terrorists and criminals. 
the FBI's Next Generation Identification, or NGI, system, which includes facial recognition, aids in our ability to solve crimes across the country. Facial recognition is an investigative tool that can greatly enhance law enforcement capabilities and protect public safety. At the FBI, trust is crucial. Protecting the privacy and civil liberties of the American people is part of our culture. This is why when the FBI developed its facial recognition technologies, it also pioneered a best set of best practices to effectively deploy these technologies for public safety in keeping with the law and without interfering with our fundamental rights. The FBI Sieges Division has two separate programs using facial recognition technology. They are the FBI's Interstate Photo System, or IPS, or the FBI's Facial Analysis Comparison and Evaluation, or Face Services Unit. Specifically, the NGI IPS allows authorized law enforcement agencies the ability to use investigative tools of facial recognition by searching criminal mugshots. Law enforcement has performed photo lineups for decades. While this practice is not new, the efficiency of such searches has significantly improved using automated facial recognition. The FBI's policy and procedures emphasize that photo candidates returned are not to be considered positive identification. That the searches are photos and will only result in a ranked listing of candidates. The FBI requires users of the NGI IPS to follow the NGI implementation guide and the facial identification scientific working group standards for performing facial recognition comparisons. The policy places legal, training, and security requirements on law enforcement users of the NGI IPS, including a prohibition against submitting probe photos that were obtained without respect to the First and or Fourth Amendments. Photos in the NGI IPS repository are solely criminal mugshots acquired by law enforcement partners with criminal fingerprints associated with an arrest. The FBI Face Services Unit provides investigative lead support to FBI offices, operational divisions, and legal attaches by using trained face examiners to compare face images of persons associated with open assessments or active investigations against facial images available in state and federal facial recognition systems through established agreements with state and federal authorities. The Face Services Unit only searches probe photos that have been collected pursuant to the Attorney General guidelines as part of an authorized FBI investigation, and they are not retained. This service does not provide positive identification, but rather an investigative lead. Since the GAO review and the last oversight hearing in 2017, the FBI has taken significant steps to advance the FBI's facial recognition technology. At the end of 2017, the FBI validated the accuracy rate at all list sizes. In early 2018, the FBI required law enforcement users to have completed facial recognition training consistent with the face standards prior to conducting facial recognition searches in the NGI IPS. Additionally, the FBI collaborated with NIST to perform the facial recognition vendor test and determined a most viable option to upgrade its current NGI IPS algorithm. The algorithm chosen boasted an accuracy rate of 99.12%. Leveraging the NIST results, the FBI is implementing the upgraded facial recognition algorithm. I would like to thank the men and women of the FBI for their unwavering commitment. I am proud to be working alongside so many mission-focused staff protecting the country against horrific crimes. I also want to thank the members of this committee for their engagement on this issue on behalf of the American people and our law enforcement partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Goodwin. Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss GAO's work on the FBI's use of face recognition technology. Over the past few decades, this technology has advanced rather quickly, and it now has wide-ranging usage, from accessing a smartphone to social media and to helping law enforcement in criminal investigations. However, questions exist regarding the accuracy of the technology the transparency in its usage, and the protection of privacy and civil liberties when that technology is used to identify people based on certain characteristics. Today, I will discuss 
the extent to which the FBI has ensured adherence to laws and policies related to privacy and transparency regarding its use of face recognition technology, as well as whether the FBI has ensured its face recognition capabilities are sufficiently accurate. I also will provide updates on the priority recommendations that GAO issued in April of this year regarding this technology. In our May 2016 report, we noted that two legally required documents, the Privacy Impact Assessment, otherwise known as the PIA, and the System of Records Notice, otherwise known as the SORN, were not being published in a timely manner. These documents are vitally important for privacy and transparency because the PIA analyzes how personal information is collected, stored, shared, and managed, while the SORN informs the public about the very existence of the systems and the types of data that are being collected, among other things. DOJ has taken actions to expedite the development process of the PIAs, but it has yet to update the process for issuing the SORNs. We also reported on accuracy concerns about FBI's face recognition capabilities. Specifically, we found that the FBI conducted limited assessments of the accuracy of the face recognition searches before they accepted and deployed the technology. For example, the face recognition system generates a list of the requested number of photos. The FBI only assessed accuracy when users requested a list of 50 possible matches. It did not test smaller list sizes, which might have yielded different results. Additionally, these tests did not specify how often incorrect matches were returned. Knowing all of this, the FBI still deployed the technology. The FBI often uses face recognition systems operated by 21 state and two federal external partners to enhance its criminal investigations. We reported that the FBI had not assessed the accuracy of these external systems. As a result, they cannot know how accurate these systems are. Yet the FBI keeps using them. Moreover, we found that the FBI did not conduct regular reviews to determine whether the searches were meeting users' needs. We made recommendations to address all of these accuracy concerns. DOJ has yet to implement these RECs. As you are aware, in April of this year, we issued our annual priority recommendations report, which provided an overall status of DOJ's open recommendations and outlined those that GAO believes should be given high priority. This report included six recommendations related to face recognition. As of today, five of those six remain open. The use of face recognition technology raises potential concerns about both the effectiveness of the technology in aiding law enforcement and the protection of privacy and individual civil liberties. This technology is not going away, and it is only going to grow. So it will be important that DOJ take steps to ensure the transparency of the systems so that the public is kept informed about how personal information is being used and protected, that the implementation of the technology protects individuals' privacy, and that the technology and systems used are accurate and are being used appropriately. Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee, this concludes my remarks. I'm okay. happy to answer any questions you have. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roman. Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee, I'm Chuck Romine, Director of the Information Technology Laboratory at the Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss NIST's role in standards and testing for facial recognition technologies. In the area of biometrics, NIST has been working with public and private sectors since the 1960s. NIST's work improves the accuracy, quality, usability, interoperability, and consistency of identity management systems and ensures that United States interests are represented in the international arena. NIST research has provided state-of-the-art technology benchmarks and guidance to industry and to U.S. government agencies that depend upon biometrics recognition. NIST leads national and international consensus standards activities in biometrics, such as facial recognition technology, but also in cryptography, electronic credentialing, secure network protocols, 
software and systems reliability, and security conformance testing, all essential to accelerate the development and deployment of information and communication systems that are interoperable, reliable, secure, and usable. NIST biometric evaluations advance the technology by identifying and reporting gaps and limitations of current biometric recognition technologies. NIST evaluations advance measurement science by providing a scientific basis for what to measure and how to measure. NIST evaluations also facilitate development of consensus-based standards by providing quantitative data for development of scientifically sound, fit-for-purpose standards. NIST conducted the Face Recognition Grand Challenge and multiple biometric Grand Challenge programs to challenge the facial recognition community to break new ground solving research problems on the biometric frontier. Since 2000, NIST's Face Recognition Vendor Testing Program, or FRVT, has assessed capabilities of facial recognition algorithms for one-to-many identification and one-to-one -one verification. NIST expanded its facial recognition evaluations in 2017. NIST broadened the scope of its work in this area to understand the upper limits of human capabilities to recognize faces and how these capabilities fit into facial recognition applications. Historically and currently, NIST biometrics research has assisted the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, and Department of Homeland Security, or DHS. NIST's research was used by DHS in its transition to 10 prints for the former U.S. visit program. NIST is currently working with FBI and DHS to analyze face recognition capabilities, including performance impacts due to image quality and demographics, and provide recommendations regarding match algorithms, optimal thresholds, and match gallery creation. NIST's Face Recognition Vendor Testing Program was established in 2000 to provide independent evaluations of both prototype and commercially available facial recognition algorithms. Significant progress has been made in algorithm improvements since the program was created. NIST is researching how to measure the accuracy of forensic examiners matching identity across different photographs. The study measures face identification accuracy for an international group of professional forensic face examiners working under circumstances approximating real-world casework. The findings, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, showed that examiners and other human face specialists, including forensically trained facial reviewers and untrained super-recognizers, were more accurate than the control groups on a challenging test of face identification. It also presented data comparing state-of-the-art facial recognition algorithms with the best human face identifiers. Optimal face identification was achieved only when humans and machines collaborated. As with all areas, for face recognition, rigorous testing and standards development can increase productivity and efficiency in government and industry, expand innovation and competition, broaden opportunities for international trade, conserve resources, provide consumer benefit and choice, improve the environment, and promote health and safety. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on NIST's activities in facial recognition, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Goldman. Good morning, Chairman Cummings, Ranking Member Jordan, and distinguished members of the committee. And thank you for the inviting me before you to discuss the future of biometric identity management at the Transportation Security Administration. I am Austin Gould, the Assistant Administrator for Requirements and Capability Analysis at TSA. I'd like to thank the committee for working with TSA as we can continue to improve the security of transportation systems, and particularly for your support of our officers at airports nationwide. TSA's establishment in 2001 charged the agency with providing transportation system security. A key component to performing this mission is positively identifying passengers who are boarding aircraft and directing them to the appropriate level of physical screening. This primarily occurs when passengers enter a checkpoint and present themselves to a security officer. Since its inception, TSA has strived to carry out that role as effectively and efficiently as possible using available technology. 
Recognizing the need to positively identify passengers in an era where fraudulent means of identification are becoming more sophisticated and prevalent, TSA has consistently sought new processes and technologies to improve performance while protecting passengers' privacy. To that end, TSA's 2018 Biometrics Roadmap identifies the steps that the agency is taking to test and potentially expand biometric identification capability at TSA checkpoints, which we believe can both enhance security and improve passenger experience. The roadmap has four major goals. Partner with Customs and Border Protection on biometrics for international travelers, operationalize biometrics for TSA pre-check passengers, potentially expand biometrics for additional domestic travelers, and develop the infrastructure to support these biometric efforts. Consistent with the biometrics roadmap, TSA has conducted pilots that use facial biometrics to verify identity at certain airports. These pilots are of limited scope and duration and are being used to evaluate the applicability of biometric technology for TSA operations. The pilots to date have been executed in conjunction with Customs and Border Protection. Each pilot has been supported by a privacy impact assessment and passengers always have the opportunity to not participate. In these cases, standard manual identification process is used. I have observed the pilot currently underway in Terminal F in Atlanta for international passengers. Of note, virtually every passenger chose to use the biometric identification process. The facial capture camera used for this pilot was in active mode, meaning that it only captured a facial image after the passenger was in position and the officer activated it. The match rate is extremely high and passengers moved rapidly through the checkpoint. In that regard, biometrics represents a unique opportunity for TSA. This capability can increase security effectiveness for the entire system by using biometric identification while also increasing throughput at the checkpoint and enhancing the passenger's experience. The ability to increase throughput while providing more effective passenger identification will be extremely beneficial as we continue to see increasing passenger volumes, which are growing at a rate of approximately 4% annually. In fact, we experienced our busiest travel day ever on 24 May, the Friday Memorial Day weekend, when we screened approximately 2.8 million passengers and crew. TSA is committed to addressing accuracy, privacy, and cybersecurity concerns associated with biometrics capture and matching. In that regard, and pursuant to Section 1919 of the TSA Modernization Act, DHS will submit a report that includes assessments by TSA and CBP that were developed with the support of the DHS Science and Technology Directorate. This report will address accuracy, error rates, and privacy issues associated with biometric identification. Looking ahead, TSA plans to continue to build upon the success of past pilots by conducting additional ones at select locations and limited durations to refine requirements for biometric implementation at TSA checkpoints. These pilots will be supported by privacy impact assessments, clearly identified through airport signage, and passengers will always have the opportunity to choose not to participate. To close, TSA is in the process of the systemic, systematic assessment of the applicability of biometric identification at our checkpoints. This identification process will enhance aviation security while also increasing passenger throughput and making air travel a more enjoyable experience. TA's system will be used for passenger identification and, determine the, and to determine the appropriate level of screening only. It will not be used for law enforcement purposes. And as always, passengers will have the opportunity to not participate. Thank you for the opportunity to address this important issue before the committee, and I look forward to answering your questions. I now recognize myself. Um, Ms. Del Greco, uh, in 2017, the Government Accountability Office testified before our committee that the FBI had signed contracts with at least 16 states to be able to request searches of their photo databases. GAO stated that most of these systems access drivers' uh, licensed photos, but several states also include uh, mug shots or corrections photos. Mr. Greco, can you explain how the FBI decides to search a state database versus when it searches its own system and how this policy is determined? 
I would be happy to explain that. The, at the FBI, we have a service called FACE Services Unit. They process uh, background checks and uh, process facial recognition searches of the state DMV photos. They do this in accordance with the Attorney General guidelines. Uh, an FBI field office has to have an open assessment or an active investigation. Uh, they submit the probe photo to the FBI FACE Services Unit. We launch the search to the state. The state runs the search for the FBI and, and provides a candidate list back. With regard to the NGI IPS, the Interstate Photo System, the FACE Services Unit will utilize that repository as well as the DM photo, DMV photos. However, state and local and federal law enforcement agencies only have access to the NGI Interstate Photo System. These are the FBI mugshots that are associated with a 10 print criminal card associated with a criminal arrest record. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do individuals who consent to having their faces in the non-criminal databases also consent to having their faces searched by the FBI for criminal investigations. For example, when applying for a driver's license, does someone consent at the DMV to being in a database searchable by the FBI? The FBI worked uh, diligently with the state representatives in each of the states that we have MOUs. Mm -hmm. We did so with, under the state's authority uh, to allow uh, photos to be used for criminal investigations. We also uh, abided by the Federal Driver's License Privacy Protection Act, and we consider that a uh, uh, very important process for us uh, to access those photos to assist the state and local law enforcement and our federal agencies. Well, you just said state authority allows you to do this. One question that our ranking member has uh, been or asking over and over again is does any, do you know whether in these states do any elected officials have anything to do with these decisions? In other words, um, where's that authority coming from? And we're trying to figure out with something affecting so many citizens, uh, whether elected officials uh, have anything to do with it. Do you know? I do. Uh, I, only in one state, the state of Illinois, did an elected official uh, uh, sign the MOU. In the other states, they were done so with the state representatives. This is state law that's um, established at the state level prior to facial recognition and our program getting started. We're just leveraging that state law. That state law is already in place. We did work with the Office of General Counsel at the FBI and the, and the attorney level at the state level. Well, if it was prior to facial recognition coming into existence, uh, I'm just wondering, do you, you, you think that uh, whatever laws you're referring to, um, anticipated something like facial recognition? It's my understanding that uh, the states established those laws because of fraud and abuse of driver's license. And uh, we are just reviewing each of the state laws and working with the representatives in those states to ensure that we can leverage that again for criminal investigation. And so when you say leverage, you, I guess you're saying that there were laws that were out there mm -hmm. Uh, did not, these laws did not anticipate something like facial recognition, and now the FBI has decided that it would basically take advantage of those laws. Is that right? Is that a fair statement? The, the Federal Driver's License Privacy Protection Act, mm -hmm. it allows the state to disclose personal information and including a photo or an image obtained in connection with a motor vehicle record to law enforcement to carry out its a function, official function. All right, let me just, I just have a few more questions. We have seen significant concern among certain states about providing this level of access to the FBI. For example, during our May 22nd hearing, we learned that Vermont suspended the FBI's use of its driver's license database in 2017. Is that correct? I'm not aware of that, sir. 
uh, well, it's, 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 it is accurate. Um, Ms. Del Greco, how many states have provided this level of direct access to the FBI? We do not have direct access. We submit a probe to the state. There's 21 states. 21 states, okay. And what we did, sir, in the last two years since the last oversight hearing, our Office of General Counsel reviewed every single MOU to ensure that it met the federal and the state authorities. Does the FBI have plans to increase the number of states that, the, that provide the FBI with uh, access to its databases? That would be up to the state, sir. We have reached out to all the states, but it's up to them and their state authorities and state representatives if they want their data used. It's, it's, it's optional for them. When states agree to provide this level of access to the FBI database, are they aware of the FBI policies? Uh, are they aware of the policies when searching uh, their systems and many, any changes that are made to, to these policies? It is made extremely clear to each of the states how the information will be used, the retention, we purge all photos coming back to us from the state. We ask that the state purge all of the probe photos that we send them. And there's, how, there's, how, do you, how do you make them aware? We have active discussions and then it's, it's in the MOU, sir. Is the FBI undergoing any current negotiations to expand the information available uh, for FBI face services, photo searches? If so, can you please describe these negotiations? I'm not aware of any current negotiations right now, sir. Now, finally, we, we also heard reports that the FBI can search photo databases of other agencies, including the Department of State. Are there any limits to this access? The searches of the State Department's photo are in accordance with an active FBI investigation and are only done so under the Attorney General guidelines followed by the FBI. And can the FBI perform a face recognition search for any American with a passport? For an open assessment or uh, an active investigation only by the FBI, sir. All right, I now recognize Mr. Gosar. I thank the chairman and thanks for bringing this important issue to the forefront. Now, um, I know we don't have uh, uh, Border Patrol here uh, and their use of the facial recognition to meet uh, the congressional mandate for biometrics. Um, and I know that they've had some success. Also, I'm from the state of Arizona and our Department of Transportation uh, uses this technology to combat fraudulent driver's license applications. Uh, Mr. Gould and Ms. Del Greco, can you give us a little bit more inference uh, and details on some of the successes with partners that you uh, have been working with? Ms. Del Greco. The successes that we've had are with majority are with state and local law enforcement. Uh, the FBI is not a positive identification. It provides investigative leads out to law enforcement and to our FBI field offices. Um, some of those successes are uh, assisting with uh, the capture of a terrorist in Boston, assisting with uh, um, the, putting the pieces together to identify uh, where a pedophile is that was trying to avoid the law enforcement for 20 years, uh, and also assisting in uh, identifying uh, a person that was on the 10 most wanted list for homicide. Mr. Gould. Sir, our greatest success in terms of partnering has been with Customs and Border Protection. We leverage their traveler verification system for biometrics identification at our checkpoints. As I said in my opening statement, we're doing this solely on a pilot basis, but so far the results have indicated a very high positive match rate, and it's increased throughput through our checkpoints. Now, Mr. Romine, um, at our last hearing, we heard some uh, disturbing uh, uh, facts about accuracy of facial recognition. Um, uh, can you uh, give us some idea about from what you see how we're uh, going to be able to be much more accurate in that application? Uh, yes, sir. The most recent testing that we've conducted demonstrates significant improvement uh, over previous tests. We conducted tests uh, in, in 2014, 2010 and 2014. Uh, and demonstrated certain limitations associated with facial recognition 
uh, accuracy. Uh, the most recent test results uh, will be uh, published this month uh, for the FRVT one-to-many evaluation that is, is being readied, but the results uh, so far suggest substantial increases in uh, accuracy across the board. So what sort of accuracy rates are you finding in the different uh, algorithms' ability to match an image against a larger gallery of images? The accuracy rates that we're seeing, uh, we have many different participants who have submitted algorithms, uh, uh, approximating 70 participants in our, in our testing. Uh, the best algorithms are performing at a rate of uh, approximately 99.7 uh, uh, in terms of uh, accuracy. Um, the, uh, there's still a wide variety or wide variance across the number of algorithms, so this is certainly not commoditized yet. Uh, some of the participants uh, fared significantly poorer than that, but the best algorithms are in the 99 to 99.7 uh, category. So are there algorithms that you've tested that you would recommend for law enforcement? We don't make recommendations uh, about specific algorithms. We provide the data necessary for uh, making informed decisions about how an algorithm will perform in a, uh, in a field. So for law enforcement, for example, uh, accuracy rates are one important aspect that needs to be considered, but there are other aspects that have to be taken into consideration for procurement or acquisition of such. So uh, going back to the development of algorithms, really the bias is, can be built into those that are manufacturing or building the algorithm. Isn't that true? It is true that uh, the algorithms, depending on the way that they have been developed, uh, can have biases associated with them. The, uh, in, in many cases, the improvement that we see in the performance of these algorithms, the dramatic improvement, comes from a transition that the uh, vendor community and participant community have made to uh, deep learning algorithms, these machine learning algorithms that uh, are what has made the difference. Now, let me, let me be clear, we, tr we test these or we evaluate these as black boxes, and so my assertion there is from discussions that we've had with vendors and not from examination of the algorithms uh, themselves. Um, and the training of those uh, algorithms uh, determines the, the level of uh, bias that may exist uh, within the algorithms themselves. I thank the chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this second hearing on facial recognition. I thank the ranking member as well. Uh, it's good to have bipartisan uh, interest on this issue. Uh, Ms. Del Greco, I certainly understand the, the dynamic at play when there is an active FBI investigation ongoing and you're reviewing, you know, mug shots of, uh, of uh, known criminals. But uh, Mr. Gould, uh, according to the biometrics roadmap released by TSA in September 2018, TSA seeks to expand the use of facial recognition technology to, quote, the general flying public, close quote, in specific locations, but the general flying public. And TSA envisions the use of technology upon domestic flights as well as international, which would capture the faces of mostly American citizens. And I'm just curious, going back to the chairman's original question, what's the legal basis? I'm not talking about a situation with the FBI where you might have, you hopefully would have probable cause, where does the TSA find its, its uh, justification, its legal justification for capturing the facial uh, identity of, of the flying public? Yes, sir. In accordance with the Aviation Transportation Security Act of 2001, TSA is charged with positively identifying passengers who are boarding aircraft. Right. That Let me just stop you right there. So. We all fly at least a couple of times a day. Yes, sir. A week. So we, we have, now you have to have a, a, a certified license. You can't go with the old version that your state had. Now we have uh, much more accurate licenses. We surrender that. Oftentimes in the, in, the, uh, in the airport during the boarding process, you've got to show it a couple of times. Uh, you've got a ticketing issue there. So you're doing that right now. 
Yes, you sir. You have been doing that for a long, long time. Manually, yes, sir. Right, right, right. So now you're saying that you're going to do these pilot programs and you're just going to, uh, you're going to herd people. Now you're saying voluntarily, but I can imagine, like you've done with uh, PreCheck, you can either agree to surrender your right to, to uh, anonymity and wait in the long line, or you can give up your Fourth Amendment rights and go in the quick line. Is that the, is that the dynamic that's going on here? Sir, with respect to expanding to the general traveling public, we anticipate using, and we've not tested this yet, a one-to-one -one matching capability at the checkpoint. You produce your credential, you stick it in a machine, and the machine identifies whether or not your image, which is captured by the camera, matches the image that's embedded in the credential, and it returns a match result. That will then allow you to proceed through the checkpoint. Should you decide not to participate in that program, we will always have the option to do that process manually. Right, but to match, you've got to have You've got to have that data in the in the. Uh, you've got to have that data onboarded in the technology to begin with to match something with, right? Sir, that data is embedded in your credential. So the photograph is on your driver's license, for example. There's a digital recording of that image in the credential, and when your picture is captured by the camera, it is matched to the photograph on the credential. It does not depart the checkpoint for any database search or anything like that. Okay. That's the one-to-one -one identification that we intend to use with a broader traveling public. And that's it. You don't, you don't uh, anticipate taking, uh, using a, a database or gathering, collecting a database of information within TSA with which to identify passengers. Sir, for international travelers who have a passport photo on record and for TSA pre-check passengers who also provide a passport photo, we will match them to a gallery. But for the general traveling public that does not participate in those programs and merely has a credential, that matching will occur what, at the check. What's the checkpoint. size of the gallery? What do you anticipate? Is that, so if any, anybody engages in international travel, is that, are they, are they going to be in that or are they, they uh, foreign nationals who travel to the U.S.? Sir, the gallery that we use right now with TVS includes anyone who is traveling internationally and who has a photo on record. Well, here's, here's the problem. We had a, a, a problem with OPM where we had 20 million individuals, their personal information, uh, social security numbers, everything that they, uh, they, they submitted with, uh, on, on federal documents to OPM and uh, stolen by, uh, we think, the Chinese. I'm just... Just curious and, and, and concerned that uh, we don't have a great track record here in protecting people's personal information. Yes, sir. And adhering to cybersecurity rules associated with this program is something that we take very, very seriously. I hope so. All right. I, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for appearing before your committee today. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, a document from the Security Industry Association. It's Association for Cyber Security Providers. It's just a general knowledge a document. I ask unanimous consent. Without objection. So ordered. During this emerging technology era of digital technologies, it, I think it's important uh, that we refer to technologies that we've had existing for quite some time. In 2005, as a police officer, we had, in a, the city that I patrolled, we had access to a, a, a camera that was disguised, a series of cameras that was disguised as a, as a transformer on an electric pole, where we had large numbers of uh, complaints and crimes in portions of the city. And the citizenry themselves would want these this crimes solved and investigated. And we would have the, the, the linemen for the electric company install this camera. And we would solve many crimes. And crimes would go down. This was 15 years ago. We have license plate readers right now. Madam, gentlemen, I'm quite sure you're familiar with license plate readers. We use them from sea to shining sea. If your vehicle is on a public road, then you're subject to a license plate reader. In fact, these cameras are not available to just law enforcement, but any citizen 
uh, if you choose to invest the treasure, they're quite expensive. You can read the license plate, and this is cross-reference to the DMV. And they'll know exactly what vehicle passed in front of that camera. These cameras have been used to successfully investigate and solve crimes, some of them heinous crimes, crimes numbering in the scores of thousands across the country. I have in my home 11 smart cameras. These cameras are connected to software, the high-resolution digital cameras. The software interprets the imagery to determine if it's a familiar person or not. If it's a familiar person that's, that the cameras have learned is a constant visitor to my home or myself or my wife, my son, et cetera, then there's no alert sent to the security company. If it's not a familiar person, then a human being receives a prompt and looks at that camera feed to my home. These are technologies that exist and we all have. Everyone, everyone here wants to protect Fourth, Am um, Fourth Amendment rights and privacy rights of American citizenry. None of us want our constitutional protections violated. But the fact is, this emerging, this emerging technology of facial recognition is, is coming and it's reflecting, it's reflecting just the advancement of our digital uh, technologies that we have already employed across the country but I go now. and deployed in, in public areas, including airports. Fight with the R's. Thank you. You're very welcome. Ms. Del Greco, like any technology, there's a chance for abuse. Would you concur? We feel that at the FBI that following policies and procedures are extremely important. Thank you. And it, these are human beings following policies and pr procedures, correct? We require all state and local, authorized state and local uh, law enforcement entities to adhere to the required training. And Thank you, ma'am. So the technologies that we're viewing, the, these, these cameras don't, they don't make arrests, do they? They just add to the, to the data of a case file or to the, the, the strength of an investigation and then a human being, an investigator must follow up on that and determine if you have probable cause for arrest. Is that correct? Our system doesn't capture, capture real time. It's a probe photo has to be submitted to the NGI IPS by law enforcement and they have to have authority to access our system for a law enforcement purpose. Well, the, the concern of this, of this committee as it should be is the potential abuse of this technology. And I, I believe the point that we, should, that we should clarify in my remaining 10 seconds here is that human beings are ultimately in control of the investigative effort and that the technology that's viewed is, is part of a much larger totality of circumstances any, in any criminal investigation. Would you concur with that, ma'am? For the FBI, we're very strict on the use of our system and the authorities that are provided to those law enforcement entities. Thank you, Madam. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Yeah, what, what do you mean by strict? What does that mean? Since the last hearing in 2017, the FBI, we take this very seriously, sir. We, we went out to our advisory policy board made up of over 100 state, local, federal, and tribal entities. We talked to them about the GAO findings. We talked to them about collecting photos in, in, against the First and Fourth Amendments. We require state and local and federal and tribal entities to have training to submit a photo to the NGI IPS. We, re, we restrict the access unless they're authorized to have it. We also put out the NGI policy and implementation guide, and we told the states they must follow the standards that were identified in the facial identification scientific working group standards. Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for uh, conducting this hearing and the witnesses for being here. Uh, let me start with uh, the GAO. Uh, recommended in May of 2016 that the FBI make changes to ensure transparency of its use of facial recognition technology. In April 2019, GAO released a letter to the Department of Justice highlighting these recommendations, recommending, and I quote, 
DOJ determine why, number one, privacy impact assessments, and two, a system of records notice were not published as required and implement corrective actions, end of quote. DOJ did not agree with either of these recommendations and the FBI still has not fully implemented the two open recommendations offered by GAO. Dr. Goodwin, can you explain the importance of transparency when it comes to the FBI's use of facial recognition technology? Yes, thank you, sir. So um, as you mentioned, we made six recommendations, three of them related to privacy, three of them related to accuracy. Only one of those has been closed as implemented. The ones that we made related to privacy and accuracy focus on the privacy impact assessment, and that is a requirement under the eGov Act of 2002 that PIAs, um, PIAs be conducted to help determine the privacy implications and evaluate the protections. And so the DOJ has disagreed with that. We know that they, actually, we know that they are concerned about privacy and transparency, but they disagree with our recommendation. These are legally required documents that they have to submit. So they have to submit the PIA and they have to submit the SORN. The SORN is required under the Privacy Act. And that provides information. Anytime there's a change to the system or a change to the technology, they have to make that information publicly available so that the public knows what's going on. And so we stand behind those recommendations because those speak to transparency, those speak, and those speak to privacy. And to this date, those documents and have not been made that is correct. public. So Ms. Del Greco, can you explain why the FBI disagrees with these transparency-focused recommendations? I believe the DOJ disagrees with GAO's assessment of the legal requirements. Uh, the FBI did publish both the PIA and the SORN. Uh, initial uh, developments of the face recognition, we had privacy attorneys embedded in our process to develop the protocols and procedures, and we have submitted updates, continued updates to the PIA and the SORN, and we've provided updates to GAO. Okay, so what, what steps do you take to protect privacy when conducting face recognition searches? The FBI monitors the appropriate um, audits with audits of the state, local, federal, and tribal entities. We look at for system requirements. We provide outreach to our users, and to date, we have not had any violations or um, notice from the public that, that they feel like their rights are, are violated. And to what extent do you share the steps you take with the public? So those, with regard to the PIA and the SORN, those are on behalf of the Department of Justice, and I would have to take that question back to them, sir. I see. Would you get back to us with a response? Yes, sir. You know, I'm concerned that the FBI is not fully complying with its notice obligations when it comes to the use of facial recognition. Uh, Ms. Del Greco, when the FBI arrests an individual based on a lead generated by face recognition, does it notify a defendant of that fact? It, so those uh, are through FBI open assessments or active investigations, and they're done so uh, conforming and following the Attorney General guidelines, and that would be for an active FBI investigation. So how many times has the FBI provided notice to criminal defendants that face recognition was used in their case? As part of a criminal investigation, I don't believe that's uh, part of the process. Oh, what about when it gets to trial? Do they get, I guess through discovery, they get that? So the FBI Face Services Unit, and that's the department that I re represent at the CGIS Division uh, in Clarksburg, West Virginia, we provide a candidate back to the FBI uh, field office, uh, two or more candidates, and they make the determination whether that is a match or not, or their person of interest that they're looking for. So does the FBI provide uh, other candidate matches to the defendant as part of Brady evidence or discovery? I'm not aware of any other uh, information other than a candidate back from a search of the facial uh, NGI interstate photo system. Okay, well, what, what steps are the FBI taking to ensure that its use of the tech 
technology is as transparent as possible by, by ensuring proper notification. The FBI provides policy and procedures out to state and local entities that they must follow. And uh, they have to follow the standards that we establish. And uh, they have to make sure that they do so in accordance with authorized law enforcement purposes. So how does the public know whether their face image might be subject to searches you conduct? The law enforcement entity would have to have the authority to do so for a criminal justice purpose in order to access the NGI interstate photo system. I see. All right. My time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Goodwin, did the FBI meet all requirements of the government law? So as I mentioned earlier, the, the PIA is what is the e-government e kind of. Um, Did they meet e all the requirements? I was kind of looking for a yes or no. Did they meet all the requirements when no. they implemented? No. Did the FBI we, have, we, have, we still have open recommendations oh, I understand. related to the, did the FBI, Dr. Goodwin, did the FBI publish privacy impact assessment in a timely fashion as it was supposed to when it implemented FRT in 2011? No. Did the FBI? follow proper notice, file proper notice, specifically the system of record notice in a timely fashion when it implemented facial recognition technology? No. Did the FBI conduct proper testing of the next generation interstate photo system when it implemented FRT? Proper in terms of determining its accuracy for its um, use? Yes. No. Did the FBI test the accuracy of the state systems that it interfaced with? No. So let me just, 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 just to be, didn't follow the law, the e-government law, didn't file proper privacy impact assessment notices like it was supposed to, didn't provide timely notice, didn't conduct proper testing of the system it had, and didn't check the accuracy of the state system that it was going to interface with, right? That Those five correct. things they didn't do. That is correct. But Ms. Del Greco said, we have strict standards. You can count on us. We've got memorandums of understanding with the respective states to safeguard people. That's what she told us. But when, when they started this system, stood up this system, there were five key things they were supposed to follow that they didn't. And my understanding is they still haven't corrected all those. Is that accurate? That, that is correct. So they still haven't fixed the five things they were supposed to do when they first started. We but still have five open recommendations. But we're supposed to believe, don't worry, everything's just fine. And we haven't even got to the fundamentals yet. We haven't even got to the First Amendment concerns, the Fourth Amendment. We're just talking about the process for implementing, standing up the system. Ms. Del Greco, you said earlier to the chairman, I think you used the word strict policies that we follow. Now, how are we supposed to have confidence in strict policies that you're going to follow when you didn't follow the rules when you set the thing up in the first place? Sir, the FBI published uh, both the PIA and the SORN. The DOJ, Department of Justice, disagrees with GAO on how they interpret the legal assessment of the PIA. You disagree with the them in one area or all five? I believe in the three areas of the findings for GAO. But you got five problems. The accuracy was tested of the system. We disagree with GAO. And actually, since the uh, uh, last hearing in 2017, the FBI went back and we evaluated our current algorithm again at all list sizes. And the accuracy uh, boasted uh, above a 90% percentile than, than what we had reported initially in the hearing. We do care about the accuracy of the system earlier, and the testing. Earlier you said, when the chairman was asking some questions, you said that there are folks who sign memorandums of understanding between someone at the FBI signed some document and someone in the 21 respective states who allow access to their database signs these memorandums under. Who are the people signing that document, signing away the rights of the citizens in their respective states? Who are those individuals? Our Office of General Counsel works with the state representatives in the state that garner those authorities. But, but not state representatives in the sense that they're elected to the General Assembly in those respective states. Some person designated by somebody to sign away. I know in Ohio, like I, I think I said this two weeks ago, we have 11 million people in our state. My guess is eight, nine, 10 million of them drive. So someone is signing away access to those nine million people's 
facial record, their picture and everything else in that database. Who is that individual? The state uh, authorities are public documents that uh, anyone could get access to. We work with the appropriate state officials. We review those documents very carefully. We talk about the use of the data, and we make sure they're in accordance with our, our federal Driver's License Privacy Protection Act as well. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, again, I, I just come back to the basics. If, if five key things they're supposed to do when they started implementing this system, I think dating all the way back to 2011, if I read the material correctly, um, that they didn't, didn't follow, and yet we're supposed to believe, don't worry, don't worry, everything's just fine. All this happening in an environment, as we said earlier, and we learned two weeks ago, an environment where there are 50 million surveillance cameras around the country. I, again, I, I appreciate the chairman's willingness to have a second hearing on this and his willingness to work with, with the minority party in trying to figure out where we go, uh, where we go down the road. And with that, I yield back. What is your disagreement, uh, by the way, uh, with J.M.? You, keep, you said there's a disagreement. What, what is it? With regard to privacy? Yeah, yeah, yes. DOJ, uh, I understand, disagrees with their illegal assessment of the P and the SORN and the reporting of such. But I would have to take that specifically back to DOJ to respond. Yeah, would you do that for us? Please? I will, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you and the ranking member and all the panelists for being here on this important hearing. I, I, I have uh, read that facial recognition technology is susceptible to errors uh, that can have grave uh, ramifications for certain uh, vulnerable uh, populations. Uh, I've read that for some reason it is more difficult to recognize women and minorities or I'd like a private meeting with members that are interested in this on why this was reported, if it was reported uh, correctly. But what I want to do is follow up on the ranking members' questions on really the scope and accountability of this program. So Mrs. Del Greco, how many searches has the FBI run in the Next Generation ID Interstate Photo System uh, to date? How many searches? Do you have that information? I have, I have from fiscal year 2017, to April of 2019, there were 152,500 searches. Okay, and does the FBI track if the results of the, this system is useful in your investigations? We do uh, uh, ask our state, local, federal, and tribal to provide feedback uh, on the services that we provide. To date, we have not received any negative feedback. Okay, we, but uh, have, have they said that it's been successful? You know, can you get back to me in writing? There's one thing not getting any feedback. The other, is there any, any proof that this system has been helpful to law enforcement in any way? Has it led to a, a conviction? And, and get it to me in writing. Uh, how many of the FBI's uh, searches have led to arrests and convictions? Do you have that information? I do, I do not. I you do not? not. Uh -huh. How many of the FBI's uh, 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 searches have, have uh, led to the arrests of innocent people. For facial recognition, the law enforcement entity must have their authorized access to our system and they must do so for... But they ha my question was, has it led to the arrest of any innocent people? Yes or no? Not to my knowledge, ma'am. Okay. And are you tracking the number of searches that have led uh, to the arrest? You have, uh, you you don't know anything about any innocent person being arrested. Our, our system is not built to for identification. We provide two or more Okay, candidates. maybe we should change your system then, because we need accountability on if this system is working or not, or if it's just abusing people. Uh, and the FBI data kit base I read contains over 600 million photos of individuals that are permanent, primarily of people who have never been convicted of a crime. And my question is, why does the FBI need to gather photos of innocent people? We do not have uh, innocent people or citizens in our database. We have criminal mugshot photos associated with a criminal arrest. Oh, well then I, 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 uh, I, my information that I read in the paper must be wrong. I'm gonna follow up with a letter for clarification because I was told you had 600 million in your database of innocent people. So uh, to me, it's extremely important that we know whether the use of this technology leads to any benefits 
for society, especially in determining whether uh, th there is a crime that is, is helping to solve, or are we just uh, uh, weighing in on constitutional rights of people and uh, creating really constitutional risk? And we cannot know this unless there is a sufficiently uh, database for law enforcement that uh, uses this. And so my question is, what are the current reporting requirements regarding the FBI's use of facial recognition technology? Is there any oversight reporting requirements on the use of this technology? The FBI monitors appropriate uses of our technology through audits. We have a robust triennial audit where we Do have you have a database that tracks whether or not this is actually working? Is it helping law enforcement arrest people? Is it arresting innocent people? Is it keeping information on innocent people? Do you have a database that basically tells us what this program is doing and what the benefits or our penalties are to our society. No, we do not. Well, I think you should have one. And I, I'm going to go to work on one right now. And I further, uh, I'm very concerned about it. Um, and, and the American people deserve government accountability. And I actually agree with the questioning of the, uh, of the, uh, of the minority party leadership on, on this, on, on that you don't have answers on how it's working, how it was set up, what's coming out of it whether it's hurting people, helping people. Well, you don't even have information on whether it's aiding uh, law enforcement in their goal for hunting down terrorists. Uh, so we need more accountability, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Massey. Mr. Mr. I'm, I'm sorry, I recognize the Just real quick, Mr. ranking Taylor. member for unanimous consent, unanimous letter, consent request. Letter sent from the Consumer Technology Association to, uh, to Chairman Cummings about this issue. Without objection, so ordered Mr. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Romine, you reported on the accuracy of the algorithms that NIST tested. You said they're 99 to 99.7% accurate. Did you test, uh, well, first of all, that accuracy rating, I can imagine two ways the algorithm fails. One would be a false positive, and one would be failing to recognize an actual match. Uh, which, which number are you reporting? So for the, uh, let me double check because I want to be sure that I get this right. The accuracy uh, at 99.7, I believe, is false negative rates, but I'm going to have to double check and get back to you on that. Okay, that'd be great. You can get back to me later. Did you test certain conditions like siblings, the accuracy for siblings? We do have uh, the... the Perhaps the most relevant data that I can give you is uh, we do know that there is an impact on twins uh, in the database uh, or in, in the testing, uh, whether they are uh, identical twins or even fraternal twins can. Let, let me give you the data point I have. I have okay. two sons. One's two and a half years younger than the other. He can open his brother's phone. They don't look that much alike. They look mm -hmm. like brothers. Mm -hmm. He furrows his eyebrows and changes the shape of his mouth to the way he thinks his brother looks, and he opens his phone every single time. So that accuracy is not 99%, that is 0%. Now that may be an older algorithm, I'm sure they've improved uh, in a couple years since this happened. Uh, I wanna submit for the record an article in Forbes by Thomas Brewer called, We Broke Into a Bunch of Android Phones with a 3D Printed Head. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I think these aren't as accurate, like for certain special conditions, like somebody wearing a mask or, or makeup or maybe a sibling, the accuracy does not approach or may not approach 99% with some of these algorithms. What do you think? The, the situations you're describing are uh, situations where there is intent to deceive either through lack of liveness. Do, do you think so, there's intent to deceive in the world? I, I certainly do. Yeah. But what <laughs> That's what we're worried about at, at TSA is intent to deceive, not the honest actor. But let me, let me go to something else here. Um, and this question is for uh, Ms. Del Greco. The Supreme Court case Brady v. Maryland held that due process rights require government to promptly disclose potential exculpatory evidence with the defense. So in the case where multiple photos are returned, 
or there may be nine possible matches. Does the defense get access or knowledge that there were other possible matches? Let me, let me give you an example. In a prior hearing, I had somebody testify to us that a sheriff's office gave an example where a person, a person with 70% confidence was the person they ended up charging, even though the algorithm thought somebody else was at 90% confidence. So they charged the person with, that the algorithm said was 70% likely and passed over the one that was 90% likely in this case. Uh, would, can you guarantee us that the FBI would provide that type of information to the defense? First, the FBI doesn't make a match. We provide an investigative lead to our law enforcement partners. But with all evidence obtained during an investigation- Do you, do you ever provide more than one lead? We provide more than one lead sometimes, yes, sir. Okay. Two or more. It you, depends on the state. Some states want 20 candidates back, some want two back. It depends on their state system. So does the defense get access to the knowledge that there were other leads? And, and do you assign a probability that the lead or a confidence level with that facial recognition? Well, I think the prosecution team uh, must determine on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so you're not sure if they always get that? No, I'm not. We don't provide a, a, a true match, an identification back. It's up to the law enforcement entity to make that decision. Uh, a quick question. How many photos does the FACE database have access to? including the state driver's license databases? That changes daily. I don't have that, sir. Is it in the millions, tens of millions? I don't know, sir. I can provide that to you. Do you have access to Kentucky's database? Uh, I can check for you, sir. We do not. Yes, we do, sir. Okay, so you, you have access to all the photographs in the driver's license database in Kentucky. Which elected official uh, agreed to that? I believe we worked with the state authorities in Kentucky to establish the MOU. But not an elected official. The, the, the state authority is public, and it's uh, predetermined and established prior to face recognition. You, you say, so you say the laws that you're relying on were passed before facial recognition became viable. They were. They okay. were, sir. That's, that's, I think, a problem. All right, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, in May of 2016, the GAO made six recommendations uh, to the FBI, three related to privacy, which I believe one was implemented, and three related to accuracy. Can you talk about the, uh, briefly, uh, the five that were not yet implemented? Yes, sir. So the three related to privacy focus on um, devising, developing the PIA process so that it is more um, aligned with um, the requirements. The other one focuses on publishing a, the SORN in a timely manner. So basically, devising, developing the process for the PIA, developing a, a process for the SORN, and making certain that those are published in a timely fashion. And then the other three are accuracy related, and they're about um, testing, you know, expanding or testing the candidate list size, because as you know, um, the list size, we took, we took issue with the, the, the fact that they didn't test the smaller list size. Um, so that's one of them. The other one is regularly assessing whether the NGI IPS actually meets their needs. So that's an accuracy concern. And the other one focuses on the FACE database, making certain that those are also meeting the needs. So those three questions related to accuracy, I think, kind of speak to this conversation here. The information that the FBI is using that information needs to be accurate, especially if they're using them to, um, to it for their criminal investigations. It's really important that the information be accurate that they're using. And these recommendations were made three years ago. Is the lack of implementation, uh, why has that been the case for three years? That probably is a question better uh, left I'll up to the I'll come around to that. Yeah. Dr. Ramon, <laughs> uh, you stated 99.7% plus accuracy. Uh, but that is specific algorithms. When you look at the breadth of algorithms that are used, I then assume based on your statement that there are accuracy rates much lower than that, again, depending on the algorithm. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, sir. The, the range of performance in terms of accuracy for the algorithms is pretty broad. Uh, some of the participants uh, have made substantial progress and have uh, 
remarkably accurate algorithms in terms of the 99 and above uh, percent uh, for false negative rates. Um, others are as much as, I think, I believe it's about a 60-fold less uh, accurate than that, but uh, those are from a variety of sources, including uh, one university uh, algorithm for uh, research participation. And, and is there data, and, and I'm going to ask you this as well as uh, Ms. Del Greco, is there data showing facial recognition uh, accuracy versus traditional photographs and enhanced photography? I'm not quite sure I understand your question, sir. Well, whether it, 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 it's an old-fashioned technology of just using photographs versus facial recognition. Oh, I see. Um, is there any data that we have available that shows facial recognition is a, a large step in the right direction, with, even with the uh, challenges we're having here? We do have, uh, NIST also tests uh, human uh, performance in facial recognition through comparison of photographs. Um, interestingly, what we find, and I refer to my testimony, that uh, if you combine two humans, you don't really do much better than anyone individually. If you combine two algorithms, you don't really do much better than either individually. If you combine a human and a facial recognition algorithm, you do substantially better than either. Okay. And Ms. Del Greco, uh, going to you, you can answer the same question, but also would like to pivot back as to why the FBI has not implemented the five other recommendations of the GAO. The two recommendations regarding the PIA and the SORN, DOJ disagrees with uh, GAO's legal assessment of the publication of the PIA and the SORN. Um, we had privacy attorneys embedded in our process the whole time. We published a PIA and a SORN and we continue to update those accordingly, and we've provided updates to GAO. With regard to the candidate list size, since the last hearing in 2017, the FBI conducted a uh, test of our current accuracy in the system at all list sizes, and we were able to validate that the percentage was higher than what we published okay. in 2017. I just want to get one more quick question in. If a bad actor with bad intentions and the skill set to use disguises, uh, doesn't that circumvent this entire process? We provide a candidate back to, and we use uh, trained FBI examiners, as Dr. Romine alluded, the system uh, combined with the trained FBI examiner provides a better response back to the law enforcement entity. Okay, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Amash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Del Greco, does the FBI use real-time face, rec uh, face recognition on live video feeds or have any plans to do so in the future? No, we do not. Has the FBI ever experimented with real-time face recognition? Not to my knowledge, sir. Do any of the FBI's domestic law enforcement par partners utilize or plan to utilize real-time face recognition technology? Not for criminal justice purposes. Does the Department of Justice believe the FBI has statutor statutory authority to do real-time face recognition itself? Not to my knowledge. Does the Department of Justice believe the FBI has statutory authority to give states grants that would support real-time face recognition? No, sir. Ms. Del Greco and Mr. Gould, please name the companies who lobby or communicate with your agencies about face recognition products they'd like to provide. Mm. We have the, uh, the testing that we've done through NIST, but those are the only agencies that we're familiar with, and we would defer to the NIST vendors that participated in the facial recognition vendor test in 2018. Sir, the, uh, the system that TSA is prototyping in conjunction with CBP uses NEC camera and a matching algorithm that was also developed by NEC. So NEC would be the... Is that's that the, that's the company? company. That's the company that we're working with right now is CBP. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gould, how many air passengers have participated in TSA's face recognition pilots? Sir, I would have to get back to you with a number uh, on that for the record. So, you, and you couldn't tell us how many participants are U.S. citizens? No, sir. 
Under uh, what statutory authority does TSA use face recognition te technology on American citizens? We use the authority of the Aviation Transportation Security Act, which requires us to positively identify passengers who are boarding uh, aircraft and proceeding through the checkpoint. And uh, can you tell me um, what statutory authority TSA uses for face recognition technology on domestic travelers generally? Sir, so I would say it was the same authority of the Aviation Transportation Security Act. Does TSA have any plans for real-time face recognition technology in airports? Sir, if you mean real-time by facial capture and matching at the checkpoint, then yes, that is what we're pursuing. And uh, has TSA considered the privacy implications of real-time face recognition technology? Oh, yes, sir, absolutely. We've done privacy impact assessments associated with this. There's signage at the airports that clearly identifies that we're using facial recognition um, technology in a pilot manner to identify passengers. And we don't store any photographs on the camera. And uh, will travelers be able to opt out? Yes, sir. Pro travelers will always have the opportunity to not participate in the program. And, and you think that's true now and into the foreseeable future? Yes, sir. Um, do you have plans to implement face recognition technology at uh, additional points in airports beyond, uh, besides gates or security checkpoints? We are prototyping facial recognition technology at bag drops. So when you drop a, a bag off to be placed on an aircraft, uh, we can use facial technology. We're explore, exploring the use of facial technology there. And then for TSA purposes, only other, only other location is the checkpoint. Okay, thanks. I yield. Well, the Thank gentleman you, yield. Yeah, I yield to Mr. Meadows. Uh, so Mr. Gould, let me, let me come back. If you're doing it bag drops, that's not a one-on-one -on -one comparison. I mean, if you, what are you comparing it to? If you're, if you're looking at, at change, uh, checking facial recognition at bag drops, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be necessarily uh, the identification that you were talking about earlier. What pilot program are you working with with that? The, the pilot program in place right now is with Delta Airlines and CBP and TSA and Atlanta's Terminal F. And it's a matching of the passenger's bag against their identification or their photograph in the TVS, CBP TVS system. Well, well that, that, that contradicts your earlier testimony, Mr. Gould, because what you said that you were doing is just checking the biometrics within the identification uh, against a facial recognition, but it sounds like you're doing a lot more than that. Sir, this is for international travelers. Uh, no, I understand. I just came back. I came through JFK. I didn't see any of the signs that you're talking about. All right, and so I guess what I'm saying is what statutory authority gives you the ability to do that? You keep referring to a 2001. Uh, I actually am on the Transportation Committee, and I can tell you we never envisioned any of this, and I'm looking at the very statute myself here, and how can you look and suggest that the statute gives you the ability to invade the privacy of American citizens. Come inside and expire, but you may answer the question. I'm sorry, sir? You may answer the question. Okay, thank you. Um, sir, with respect to the pilot in Atlanta, it's international travelers. And the purpose of that pilot is to positively match, using biometrics, the passenger to that bag at the bag drop. The only, the Traveler's cap, uh, photograph is captured, image is captured, it is transmitted to the CBP TVS system for matching, and it returns a match result. That's it. No privacy information or any other data associated with it. With respect to JFK, there's no pilot going on there right now. It is solely in Atlanta in Terminal F. Ms. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to follow up, actually, on several of these questions. Um, you, uh, Mr. Gould, the, does the TSA record how many American citizens' faces it captured during the pilot? And if so, do you know the numbers? Uh, no, ma'am, I don't know the numbers. I'd have to submit that for the record. Yes, please. Uh, also, you, TSA uses the facial recognition systems of Customs and Border Protection, CBP, which may not restrict how private corporations use passenger data. Uh, according to an August 2018 article from the New York Times, CBP, quote, says, has said it cannot control how the companies use the data because they are not collecting photographs on CBP's behalf. An official stated that, quote, he believed that commercial carriers had no interest in keeping or retaining the biometric data they collect and that the airlines have said they are not doing so. 
But if they said, if they did, he said, that would really be up to them. TSA itself has said that it intends to pursue innovative models of public-private partnerships to drive collaboration and co-investment. Mr. Gold, if TSA uses CBP systems to scan the faces of American citizens, how can it ensure that the private data of these passengers is not stored or sold by private airlines? Ma'am, I would have to refer to CBP for any assessment of the security and the privacy of that system. With respect to the public-private partnership, when we refer to that, we're talking about partnering with industry, airlines, and airports solely on the front-end capture system, so basically the cameras that are being utilized. But you talk about co-investment. So in accordance with TSA's authorities, we are allowed to enter into agreements with airports and or airlines to procure equipment on our behalf, and that equipment would be the camera system only, solely for the capture. The matching in the database, that's a government system, and right now we're using the CBP TVS system. So what have you thought about how you would ensure that the private data is not stored or sold by airlines? Uh, absolutely, ma'am. First of all, when your photo is captured at a checkpoint in the pilots, it is encrypted and sent off for matching. And the database that CBP uses, the TVS system, that is cyber secure in accordance with applicable standards. And we do not transfer any private, any personally identifiable information between us and the airlines. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, what regulations do you believe should be put in place in order to prevent the abuse of passenger uh, data by airlines and other private companies? So as you know, GAO, we, we wouldn't um, have an answer, we wouldn't provide an answer to that question. The way we think about it is we have issued recommendations related to privacy and accuracy, and if those recommendations are implemented, that would actually go a long way to meeting some of the needs of, of the public as well as the needs of this committee. Sorry, can you clarify <laughs> some of those? So we, have, so we have those six recommendations oh, right. okay. related to privacy and accuracy. Only one has been implemented. Um, the, if, so we believe that if the remaining five are implemented, that would actually go a long way to answering the questions and addressing some of the concerns around privacy for the citizens and um, accuracy for the data that are being collected. And Mr. Gold, do you have issues with those recommendations? Is there something that's preventing TSA from incorporating those? So as I stated before, in accordance with Section 1919 of the TSA Modernization Act, we've executed in conjunction with CBP a thorough review of the privacy impacts associated with biometrics collection or biometrics identification at the airport, as well as any error rates and security concerns associated with that. And that report will be coming from DHS in the near future. Great. Uh, the Washington Post further stated that around 25,000 passengers travel through Atlanta's airport pilot program terminal each week. Uh, according to the article, quote, only about 2% of travelers opt out. Even assist, assuming that the systems used by TSA are 99% accurate, which they are likely not, the high volume of passenger traffic would still mean that at least hundreds of passengers are inaccurately identified each week. Does TSA keep metrics on the number of American citizens that are inaccurately identified? Uh, in accordance with our analysis, the pilots were capturing match rates and non-match rates. With respect to the actual numbers of Americans that do not return a positive match rate, I would have to submit something for the record. Please do. And Dr. Romine, what would be the most effective way for TSA to measure how accurate its facial recognition systems are when testing the identity of American citizens? We're not expert in testing full systems. We test algorithms uh, to, for, we evaluate those algorithms for uh, accuracy of, of matching. Uh, the entire system is a, uh, something that's a little bit outside my, my uh, purview. Okay, it, I personally understand the value of this technology, but I think we really need to have some clear regulations and guidance that are essential to prevent the abuse of data collected and to protect our privacy. And while I appreciate the GAO's recommendations, I think we're going to need some more um, teeth to ensure that those are implemented. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Heiss. Sounds like Mr. Roy. I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Roy. Go thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to my colleague from Georgia for letting me go now. Uh, appreciate all y'all taking the time to testify today. Appreciate your service to our nation. Uh, former uh, federal prosecutor, I appreciate the commitment to law enforcement and what you're trying to do to keep the United States and its citizens safe. Uh, I do think that there's been some very important issues involving privacy raised here today on both sides of the aisle, and I appreciate you all addressing those concerns. 
one of the line of questions was my colleague from Michigan, uh, Congressman Amash, um, asking a little bit about real-time use of this technology. And I wanted to explore that just a little bit further <clears throat> and maybe even asking sort of a simple, maybe even uh, not all that informed question. But is the United States government in any way, based on the knowledge of anybody at the table, using facial recognition technology on American citizens without their knowledge today? And in, if so, where and how? Ms. Del Greco. The FBI systems are not designed for real-time capture of uh, the American people. So it, it, to your knowledge, the United States government, from the, your base of knowledge, is not using facial recognition technology to capture information of American citizens, using it and processing it without their knowledge? The FBI anyway. does not. <coughs> I can speak on behalf of the FBI. And we re require it for a criminal purpose only in accordance with a law enforcement uh, purpose. Mr. Gold. Sir, with respect to TSA, uh, we're doing it solely with the passenger's consent. The cameras are visible, and the passenger needs to actually assume a position in front of the camera for accurate facial capture. Uh, any other witnesses? Dr. Goodwin, are you aware of anything? We are not, and the work that we've done, that's been beyond the scope. Okay. Sir? It's also outside of NIST scope. Are there any plans, do you all know of any plans to use that technology without consent of the American, uh, uh, an American citizen? Not with respect to TSA, sir. FBI? The FBI will not develop technology that outside of, for CGIS division, outside of a criminal purpose, sir. Ms. Delgarka, let me ask you a quick question. You said in response to Mr. Uh, Amash, in one of his questions about real-time use, you said, quote, not for criminal justice purposes. Can you explain, expand on that caveat? That we only collect a photo in conjunction with uh, criminal justice. Our law enforcement partners, the state and local federal entities, must be authorized to have access to our system, and they must have a criminal justice purpose in order to search our system, the NGI interstate photo system. I'd like to yield to my colleague to, from uh, Louisiana. I thank my colleague for yielding a bit of his time. Ms. Del Greco, according to the FBI, in 2017 FBI records, 10,554,985 criminal arrests were made and ran about a 59% conviction rate. I think that this body and the American people witnessing must be reminded that every American that's arrested has been arrested, and America has been arrested by probable cause, the standards of probable cause are much less than that of conviction. Is that true? That is correct, sir. Would the totality of circumstance and corroborative evidence be used on the course of a criminal investigation and, and any technology, including facial recognition technology, would that be added as a tool in the toolbox to add to perhaps a strength or a weakness of that case file? State and local entities have the option to submit uh, a probe photo in accordance with a criminal investigation. Okay, moving quickly, one of my colleagues mentioned that there was a 70% match on a subject, and, and, and that's a subject that was arrested versus a 90% match that was not arrested. Does not arrested mean not investigated? I'm not aware of that, sir. We, we provide candidates back During to the During the course of a regular criminal investigation, is reasonable suspicion grounds for investigation of, of any citizen? I'm not a law enforcement officer, sir. All right. Well, I am, and it is. Uh, probable cause is a standard for arrest beyond a reasonable doubt or the shadow of a doubt is a standard for conviction. And uh, I, I very much appreciate everyone's testimony today. This is an emerging technology. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, we should watch this technology closely and protect the, the, the rights of American citizens. But we should also recognize that this can be a very valuable tool for law enforcement and to fight crime in our country, and I yield. Ms. Norton. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, I, I, we're not Luddites here. We, we recognize, I think, uh, advancements that uh, science is making, perhaps um, this particular facial recognition 
advancement such as it is is not ready for prime time. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to ascertain here. And yet it's being used as if it were. Uh, the FBI, uh, Dr. Uh, Goodwin, um, uses this facial recognition system, uh, but cannot tell us, we've learned today, much about its, its accuracy. Now, the, G, the GAO, and we rely heavily on the GAO, of course, um, has said DOJ officials stated there is value in searching all available external data bases regardless of the level of accuracy. That's where my question goes, regardless of their level of, of accuracy. Um, the FBI has said that, uh, Ms. Del Greco, that the facial recognition tool is used for investigative leads only. Um, now, what's the value of searching inaccurate databases? Um, I can see the downside, uh, uh, mistaken identity, um, misidentification. Why is why is the why is there any value in in searching um, whatever database it appears to be the case um, is available to you based on investigative leads only? The FBI um, uses our trained face examiners to look at candidates that come back on a search for an FBI open investigation. And it evaluates all of the candidates and it provides the search Can back. Can an investigative lead lead to conviction? The, the FBI field office and the FBI agent is the one that's primary to that case. They know all the details about the case. We would not be making that decision. It would be up to them to use that as a tool. So it could, as far as you know, it could lead to a conviction or, or maybe not. That's um, correct, ma'am. I agree. So we, not only could it lead to a conviction, it might lead to inaccurate convictions. We hope not, ma'am. We hope not. Yeah, well, it could lead to conviction. Uh, perhaps uh, they would be inaccurate since we're using the database for investigative purposes alone. Uh, I'm sorry, not alone, but as well. Now, here's what bothers me um, most. There's been a prominent study done, which included an FBI expert, by the way, Ms. Del Greco. It found that leading facial recognition algorithms like ones sold by Amazon and Microsoft, IBM, were more inaccurate when used on darker skinned individuals, women, and people uh, aged 18 to 30 when compared with white men. So we do have some indication uh, when we look at what our population is. Uh, Dr. Romain, do you agree with the findings of this study? There are demographic effects. Uh, this, is, this is very uh, time dependent. It depends on the, the time at which this evaluation was done and the algorithms that were evaluated. Uh, NIST is prepared to release demographic uh, information or well, what demographic my concern, analysis. My, my concern is that there is excessive, some would say over-policing in minority communities. I understand why. Uh, but it has resulted in uh, African Americans being incarcerated at four times the rate of white Americans. African Americans are, are overrepresented in mug shots. Uh, that some rec uh, net facial recognition systems scan for pot potential uh, matches. Ms. Del Greco, uh, do you agree that both the presence, the overrepresentation of African Americans in mugshot photos, the lower accuracy rates, 
that facial recognition systems have when assessing darker skinned people such as African Americans, that it is possible that false uh, convictions could result from the FBI's use of these external systems if they are not audited. The gentlelady's time has expired. You may answer the question. The FBI uh, retains photos in our repository, mugshot photos, but they are associated with a criminal arrest and a, a finger, ten, ten print fingerprint. Um, we do provide uh, a candidate. Are they audited? Yes, they are, ma'am. We have a robust audit process with the state, federal, local, and tribal agencies. We send auditors out to those agencies, and we look at security requirements in accordance with the FBI CGIS security. We look at the policies, the procedures, and the standards to ensure that they're uh, required training and they're following our process. Mr. Heiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we uh, all are very much aware of the effects of surveillance on, on people. Uh, their, their behavior certainly changes. Uh, Non-criminal speech, uh, non-criminal behavior, it, it alters the way people behave when there's surveillance. I, just even as a pastor for many years, I know when the, with the prying eyes of the IRS and how that has had a chilling effect on speech even within nonprofit organizations and churches. Uh, so this is a, an extremely serious thing when we know, know the possibility of surveillance uh, is out there. Ms. Del Greco, has the FBI ever, uh, you mentioned a while ago the facial services unit or something to that effect. Does that particular unit or any other unit in the FBI farm for uh, images, photographs, other ideas? ID type information on American citizens through social media or whatever other platform? No, we do not, sir. Uh, does the FBI, have they ever purchased uh, from a third party contract or wherever else uh, images, photographs, ID information? No, sir. The FBI retains only criminal mugshot photos. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask to be submitted to the record. Here's a, an article by um, Joseph Cox of Vice News, Socio Spider, a tool bought by the FBI to monitor social media. Without objection, so ordered. I'd also like to submit for the record an archived copy of the sociospider.com web domain uh, that states that this software is used for on-demand or automated collection of social media user data. Uh, I would like that to be submitted. Without, without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And finally, also, I have uh, I'd like to submit to the record the purchase of order logs of the FBI Socio Spider software and service agreement and individual user license purchased uh, by Allied Associates International. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Del Greco, I, there, there have been software purchased by the FBI, and I, I uh, don't know where you're coming from to not be aware of that. Sir, I would have to um, find out from the other entities within the, within the FBI. I, I represent the technology that's used for criminal justice purpose at the CJUS division. So there's a whole other avenue of facial recognition technology taking place within the FBI that you know nothing about? Not that I'm aware of, sir. Well, evidently, if you don't know anything about this, there is. We can look into it, sir. Okay, we most certainly can. So uh, are you saying then that, to your knowledge, there's uh, no software, although there is, that's being used uh, by the FBI to collect information on, on U.S. citizens? I'm only aware of the use of uh, our system for criminal justice purpose, sir. Okay, and your system would include the systems of the driver's license database of multiple states? Our system does not uh, retain driver's license photos. But you have access to it. So there's two different systems. You have your internal system, and then you have this system that you can access. We, we do not have direct access. We, um, a 2016 study by Georgetown's Law Center on Privacy and Technology 
found that you do have access to that, a total of 117 million Americans, which comes to about one out of every two adults that you have access to that information. That is incorrect, sir. We disagree with that. The FBI, through an active FBI investigation, can submit a probe photo to our Facebook. So how many do you unit. have access to? We can submit a probe photo to the state DMVs, and they provide a candidate back. We do not have access to those photos. Uh, well, the, the study disagrees with you. There's really a pre-crime database, if you will. I've got a little bit of time. I do want to yield to the ranking member the remaining time. Thank you. Gentlemen, um, the, uh, Ms. Del Greco, just, just to go to this real-time surveillance, so uh, has the FBI or any other federal agency, agency to your knowledge ever used real-time surveillance, sort of a continuous look at, at, say, a group of people at some location? Has that ever, ever been done? No, sir, not to my knowledge. And to your knowledge, no other federal agency has done that? The IRS, any other agency has not, not done that either? Do you know? I cannot speak on behalf of the other agencies, sir. And let, let me just real quick, if I could, Mr. Chairman, the, the numbers. Um, Dr. Goodwin, how many, what number of photos does the FBI have access to in just their database? Um, in just their database, it, um, a little over 20 plus, 36 million. 36 million. And then in the databases that they can then send information to and that, that are screened and used and, and there's interface interaction with at the state level, what is the total number of photos in all those databases? So access to photos ac across all the repositories, about 640 million. 640 million photos. Only 330 million people in the country. Wow. And all this from an, the, the FBI has access to all 600 and some million photos and this is the FBI that didn't comply with the five things they were supposed to comply with when they set up the system, and they're still not in compliance with. So if you think about, like, the, the face services system and then all of the searchable, search, searchable repositories, that's over 640 million uh, photos. And, and the FBI really only searches for criminal. They're, they're looking for the criminal uh, photos. They're looking. They're doing. They're looking through all of this for their criminal investigations. But the but across all the repositories, we're talking over 600 million. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate we're that. Talk, Mr. We're talking about people who have been arrested, right? Not necessarily convicted, right? Is that right, Ms. Rico? Arrested by searching these databases, sir. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, we would have to go back and do a survey. We do every 90 days go out to our state and local agencies to see if there's any input they could provide to us. We do know there are arrests made, but it's not on the identification of the photo. It's a tool to be part of the case that yeah. they have. Yes. If I could add one more thing about the 640 million. So most of those are civil photos, but th those are well, That's what scares me. <laughs> most of them, say that again. Those are primarily civil photos. So yeah. we're talking about passports and driver's license. Yeah, sure. Just regular everyday people. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this second hearing on facial recognition. With the government's use of facial recognition increasing, it is important that this nascent technology is not rushed to market and that all communities are treated equally and fairly. Mr. Romain, in your testimony, you mentioned the report that is due for publication this fall is on demographic effects and mugshots. Can you talk a little bit about this report and your objectives? The objective uh, is to ensure complete transparency with regard to the performance of the algorithms that we evaluate uh, and to see if we can use uh, rigorous statistical analysis to demonstrate the presence or absence of demographic effects. Uh, that statistical analysis has not been completed yet. We have preliminary uh, data that have suggested that demographic effects such as difference in age, you know, across, across ages, uh, difference in sex, uh, and difference in race uh, can affect or can have, have uh, differences in terms of the performance of the algorithms. However, the increased performance across the board for the best performing algorithms uh, is, uh, we expect diminishing that effect uh, overall. 
Okay. So in the fall, we'll have the final, uh, the final report of demographic effect. I commend you for looking into this. When you're doing evaluations for companies, are you testing for demographic consistency? We do, rather than, we don't test for specific companies on their behalf. We test uh, or evaluate the algorithms that are submitted to us through this voluntary uh, program. Uh, so we don't test specifically for algorithms, uh, um, demographic effects. We're talking about the demographic effects across all of the algorithms and, uh, that, that are submitted. And then what are you doing to make sure that no categories of people are suffering from lower rates of accuracy? The, the best we can do in that is to ensure uh, transparency and uh, public uh, access to data about the, the level of the demographic effects. We, we, can't, we have no regulatory authority to do anything about that other than just make the data available for policymakers to make appropriate decisions. Did you have a comment about that? No? Okay. Mr. Gould, TSA has been partnering with CPB on biometrics for international travelers. How much training did operators receive prior to beginning the pilot program at JFK and uh, LAX? Well, the training was significant. Uh, I would say uh, multiple days of training and how the system worked, how to analyze the match results, and how to effectively use the system. What were the top complaints that were received during this uh, pilot? Program? The complaints in the public, ma'am? The top complaints, yeah. Ma'am, I'm really honestly not aware of any specific category of complaints that rose to the surface. In general, the public seems to enjoy the enhanced passenger experience by using biometrics. Any complaints by employees? Um, I would say employees in general, when you introduce new technology, the change can be somewhat challenging to use, but having just been down to Atlanta and talked to many of the operators down there, as well as the uh, federal security director in charge of the airport, they embrace the technology and find it to be a significant enhancement to security at the checkpoint. Okay. The report on disparities is due on July 2nd, 2019. Are you on schedule for publication, or, and are there any previews that you can share? Uh, I don't have any previews available that I can share. The report has been completed in accordance with Section 1919 of the TSA Modernization Act, correct? Mm -hmm. The report has been compiled and it's on its way through the Department of Congress. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 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 Ms. Del Greco, I'm, I'm not going to beat up on you, but I want, I want to come back and give you two pieces of advice. One is, and, and it's the same advice I give to every witness that sits in that seat right next to GAO. If GAO isn't happy, I'm not happy. And so here's what I would recommend on the five outstanding things is that you work with GAO to close those out, uh, it, uh, the five recommendations that they have. Are you willing to do that? Absolutely, sir. All right. Uh, the fact that you only closed one of them out last week prior to this hearing is is what I understand. Uh, is that not accurate? We I, have, I can tell you were smiling, so you didn't agree with that statement. Not that I not that I disagree. We have been completing audits. We completed 14 of the 21, and I think GAO felt that that was uh, enough to satisfy the issue. All right. The well, issue. Uh, Dr. Goodwin, if you will report back to this committee, what I would like in, in the next 60 days is the progress we're making. And Ms. Del Greco, that's as gracious as I can be when, when it comes to that. Uh, listen, we want you to have all the tools to accurately do what you need to do. One of the other, the, the second thing that I would mention is you mentioned about not having any real-time systems. And yet we had a testimony just a couple of weeks ago from Georgetown that indicated the Chicago Police Department, Detroit Police Department has real time. They purchased it where they're actually taking real time images. Do they ping the FBI to validate what they picked up in real time with what you have on your database? 
I mean, there are authorized law enforcement entities that have access to our system. We train them. We expect them to follow our policy. I, we I, I audit get, them. I, I get that. But okay. what I'm saying is, is we're concerned about real time. And you have police departments in Chicago and Detroit that are doing real time surveillance and then getting you to authenticate that through your database. Is that correct? They submit a probe photo in accordance with a criminal act. From real time surveillance. Not to my knowledge, I'm well, not aware. Uh, that's, well, that's opposite of the testimony. And so what I want you to do, and did they purchase that real-time surveillance technology with federal funds? So if you'll get back to the committee on that. Can Absolutely. you do that? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Mr. Gould, I'm going to come to you. Because uh, some of your testimony, and, and actually I've been to Dulles where we looked at CPB actually looking at, at real-time uh, facial recognition when when travelers come in and out. And so I guess you're saying that right now you're not doing that at Dulles anymore. Is that correct? Because you mentioned only Atlanta and... Sir, uh, I can't comment on the CBP program because they do it for entry and exit purposes for international okay. travel. TSA is not doing it there. Okay. So here's what I would recommend. Out of all the priorities that TSA has and all the inefficiencies that actually in this committee and other committees have, Facial recognition certainly cannot be the top priority in terms of what we're looking at to make sure our, our traveling public is safe here. Would you say that's the top priority that you have in terms of your Achilles heel? Sir, positive is, identification of travelers is this That's not the question concern. I asked. Is that the top priority? Yeah, yes or no? One Mr. of Gould. multiple significant priorities for TSA. So what's your Sir. top priority? I would say there's only there can only be one top, Mr. Gould. This is a softball question. I would say at this point, enhanced property screening at the checkpoint, CT machines for the checkpoint to do right, better so assessment of carry-on baggage. All right. So you mentioned the fact that you potentially have actually taken photos of American citizens uh, dropping off their bags. Is that correct? In my questioning earlier, you talked about the fact that you might have. Uh, part of TSA is looking at the screening process where it's not just a one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. where you're actually taking photos of people at bag drops. Is that correct? Only if they choose to participate and only in one location, and that's Terminal F in Atlanta. Okay, so you can guarantee, because I've flown out of Terminal, or Concourse F, I think is what it is, but I've, I've flown out of that on Delta, so you can guarantee that I was not photographed because I've never given anybody my permission on international travel, to my knowledge. So can you guarantee that I'm, I'm not picked up in that? Unless, that was, unless you were photographed while you were dropping off the bag? That's my question. That, no, but sir. that's my question is, is I gave no one permission to take my picture while I'm dropping off my bag. I'm an American citizen. Yes, sir. What rights, what legal rights do you have to take that photo? You should not have been photographed. Okay. And so you can't guarantee that I wasn't. So here's what I would recommend, Mr. Gould, is this. I am all about making sure that we have a screening, but I can, I can promise you I have gone through screening more than most Americans, and there are inefficiencies in TSA's problem that has nothing to do with facial recognition. And until you get that right, I would suggest that you put this pilot program on hold. Because I don't know of any appropriations that specifically allowed you to have this, this pilot program. Sir. Are, are you aware of any? Because you keep referring back to a 2001 law, yes, and I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any appropriations that have been given you the right to do this pilot program. I'm not aware of any specific appropriations. Exactly. With so I would recommend that you stop it until you find out your statutory authority. Now you'll back. Thank you very much. Before we go to Ms. Lawrence, let me uh, follow up on the gentleman's uh, request of Ms. Uh, Del Greco and Dr. Goodwin. Uh, one thing that I've noticed after being on this committee for 23 years is that um, what happens so often is that um, people say they're going to get things done, and they never get done. Um, so Mr. Meadows, uh, in the spirit of efficiency and effectiveness, has made, a, a, I think, a very reasonable request that uh, Ms. Del Greco and Dr. Goodwin get together so that we can get some of these items resolved. And so I'm going to call you all back. 
in about two months, maybe. I'll figure it out. Because I'm worried that this is going to go on and on. And in the meantime, we, I'm sure we'll be able to come up with some bipartisan solutions. But the American citizens are, I think, being placed um, in jeopardy uh, as a result of a system that is not ready for prime time. And so uh, we'll call you all back. So I hope that you all get together as soon as possible. Again, I say this because um, I've seen it over and over again, and that we'll be in the same position or worse in three years, five years, 10 years. And uh, by that time, so many citizens uh, may have been subjected to something that they should not be. With that, I call on- Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I just want to say I appreciate your leadership on that and appreciate your follow-up. Oh, no problem. Um, uh, I now call on the distinguished lady from Michigan, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Ronnie, um, do you think that third-party testing is important for the safe deployment of facial recognition technology? And I want you to know that I sit on the Criminal Justice uh, Appropriations Committee, and funding for um, NIST is, is something that I have a responsibility for. So I, I would really like the response to these questions. I think independent assessment of new technologies, uh, particularly if they're going to be used um, in, uh, in certain ways, is, is an essential part and one of the things that we're privileged to do as NIST. And how dependent are government agencies on NIST's finding? How dependent? It's hard for me to assess that. I think we certainly have uh, collaborative relationships with, uh, with DHS, with FBI, with other uh, federal agencies. Part of our statutory requirement is working with other agencies on, uh, on advancement of technologies and evaluation of technologies. Is there a way that we can move forward that you can do an assessment so that we will know um, when we're talking about um, the findings which is a critical factor right now. Is there a way that we can move forward so that we can assess how, what is the role that you play, that is played by the third party? Our, with respect to facial recognition, we have ongoing evaluations uh, uh, on a rolling basis, so um, participants can submit algorithms at any time, and we continue to provide uh, open, public, transparent, uh, uh, evaluation methodology so that everyone, federal agencies and the public, the private sector, uh, can see the results of our testing and make determinations on effectiveness of uh, the algorithms. I would, through the chair, I would like to see, uh, review those. Which organizations are currently equipped to accurately test new facial recognition technologies? We are certainly equipped to do that uh, at NIST. Um, I, I don't have any information about other entities that might also be equipped to do that. Hmm. Do you believe that NIST currently has significant funding and resources to carry out your work as the standard barrier of the facial recognition industry? Yes, we have sufficient resources today to be able to execute the program that we have in biometrics. To carry out, that's a word that you're saying. As this is evolving and we're looking at the challenges, do you have enough funding for the R&D and for the checks and balances for you to be the standard barrier of the record, the facial recognition industry. Nothing frustrates me more than to, for you to come before Congress and say, I have everything I need, and then when you don't do the job, well, we, we didn't have the funding. So I'm asking this question, and I need you to be very honest with me. I would make 
two remarks. One is we have a long track record of, uh, of delivering high quality uh, uh, evaluations uh, in biometrics for nearly 60 years. Um, the second part of it is it's a bit awkward for me in front of Congress uh, or any federal uh, uh, official to uh, speak about funding levels. I will just make the comment that any research organization can do more with more. And I'll leave it at that. Well, for me to do my job, I have to get past ACRIT, and you have to have a plan and directive. Uh, I just want to ask if anyone in the, on the panel wanted to comment on the organizations and the ability to accurately test new facial recognition technologies. Are there any comments from any of the other of you? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Chairman Cummings and Ranking Member Jordan, and thank you all for being here today. America has been a leader and an innovator in the technology sector. American companies have pioneered many of the technologies deployed around the world. However, as this sector continues to grow, we need to ensure that our government agencies are accurately deploying this technology within the bounds of law. This past week, I was in China, and I saw facial recognition technology deployed on a massive scale from the moment I was getting ready to get on the airplane. There were cameras everywhere. Alibaba recently instituted a program where customers can smile to pay. Using facial recognition technology, I also saw cameras at street crossings that can pinpoint certain individuals who are breaking traffic laws. It was rather daunting to see the government shaming individuals so publicly, which is a stark contrast to what our privacy and our liberty is in America. I mean, they would flash your face right there. Seeing this use of facial recognition technology in China poses many questions to the United States about the appropriate use of this technology. Ms. Goodwin, Dr. Goodwin, what steps can our government take to ensure facial recognition technology is being deployed in a way that is accurate? So thank you for that question. So, you know, I will always go back to the recommendations that we made when we did this work a few years ago that the that DOJ is still working through. So accuracy, transparency are key and vital to when we're think, talking about this technology, as well as just making certain that we are protecting privacy rights. So to go back to the recommendations, we, 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 wanted, we want DOJ to pay more attention to the list sizes that they're testing. We want them to regularly ass assess whether the NGI IPS, whether that information is accurate. We also want them to assess and have some understanding of whether the information that they're getting from their external partners are also accurate. Thank you. Ms. Del Greco, to your knowledge, has the FBI had any misidentifications of individuals when utilizing facial recognition technology? Um, I'd like to go back to the statement by Dr. Goodwin. We uh, did test all, since the last hearing in 2017, the FBI did test all of the list sizes and saw improvements in the accuracy. We conducted the facial recognition vendor test with NIST and uh, are implementing a new algorithm. And we work continuously with our state and federal and local partners on their use of our system. And we've also commissioned NIST to do a 2019 and onward. It's called an ongoing facial recognition test where we'll be able to test the accuracy of the system yearly. With regard to misidentification, I am not aware of any. Thank you. Okay. Then basically, my next question sort of falls right in line. Does the FBI have any plans to assess the rate of misidentifications generated by the next generation identification interstate photo system? So the system was designed to return two or more candidates. We provide a, a, an investigative lead back to law enforcement, the law enforcement entity. We require training by law enforcement to follow the NGI interstate 
uh, um, policy and implementation guide and the facial identification scientific working group standards. So anyone running a search through the NGI interstate photo system must comply with the policies and standards and they are audited by our uh, FBI triennially. Can you discuss the regulations in place that allow for an agent to utilize facial recognition technology and how strictly that these regulations are enforced? Well, I do know that for the FBI Face Services Unit, a, an FBI field office must have an open assessment or an active investigation, and they must follow the Attorney General guidelines associated with that for us to be able to receive a probe photo from them and then submit the probe photo for a search. Okay. And Ms. Dr. Goodwin, sorry. To your knowledge, has the FBI been adhering to these regulations? So we, do, we are working very closely with the, F, with the FBI. If I could go back to something Ms. Del Greco said earlier. So the, the testing that they're currently doing, the new information that they're providing, until we see that, we won't be closing our recommendations. Um, we need, to make, we need to, to make certain that they are meeting the recommendations as we have put forward to them. Okay, thank you. I yield back my time. Mr. Gomez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in our, the history of this country, we've always had this debate and this goal of trying to balance um, security with, with liberty. But in the era of facial recognition, I feel that we're, we're stumbling into the future without really understanding how much liberty we're giving up for how much security. And it's really with that understanding we have to kind of to set up guidelines that really um, dictate the use of this technology. Um, so that's where my um, approach comes from. I have a lot of concerns regarding the false positive rate of the technology, racial bias in the technology, gender bias, and even during, this is Pride Month, June is Pride Month, and I, I think about um, the transgender and non-binary communities. And we've seen reports that show that black women are more likely to be misidentified than any other group. So when you layer on top of that a transgender or non-binary black uh, individual, what, what happens to those results? Uh, Mr. Uh, Roman, have you seen any data when it comes to the LGBTQ community, specifically the transgender community? We haven't done an analysis of uh, accuracy rates for the transgender uh, community. I'm not sure how we would obtain the, the relevant data that we could use mm -hmm. to do that, um, but I am aware of uh, I've been made aware of concerns in the transgender community about uh, the, the potential for uh, problematic use here. Okay. Now, I, I appreciate that. Um, a lot of this is also revolved about training. I know that NIST has pointed out and indicate that people are likely to be, believe computer-generated results. And those who aren't specially trained in face recognition have problems in identifying people they don't know, even if they perform face identifications as part of their work. Um, so I'm kind of keeping that in mind with my questions I'm about to answer. First, um, Ms. Del Greco, what is the confidence interval level the FBI uses when it comes to uh, running the program for the matches? Is it 80%, is it 85%, is it 95%, is it 99%? Our quoted accuracy rate, and we don't have matches, let me clarify that okay. first, sir. It's a, an, a, an investigative lead, it's okay. two or more candidates. Our system's not built to, re, to respond to one okay. response. Um, currently, we have a, an 85% accuracy rate at, Although, since the that, last hearing, we... That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking when you run the program, is it set to a, a high level that it needs to be accurate to a 95% confidence level that the computer recognizes that this individual is 95% likely to be this person, or is it 80%? You know, let's, like, Amazon sells their program at 80% default. 
What do you guys run your program at? Because we don't conduct uh, an identification match, we don't look at that, sir. We do have an accuracy rate that we rely on, okay. and we are currently implementing the new NIST uh, vendor recognition test results at 99.12% at a rank one, and it's 9972 at a rank 50. Those are the new, that's the new algorithm, but because it's not a true identification, we don't so, report that. Okay. How does the FBI combat human ten tendency to trust computer-generated results? Well, through the testing with NIST for sure. And then we also use other agencies and entities, universities, to provide testing results to us. Okay. Do you train the FBI uh, personnel to perform uh, facial comparisons of persons that are unknown to them? We receive probe photos from an active investigation from uh, uh, the FBI field office, FBI agent, and they process that probe photo against our mugshot rep repository and receive a candidate back, and they are trained to evaluate. Okay. So are the, is the FBI trained personnel on the potential inaccuracies and biases of facial recognition algorithms? Bias yes. for the algorithm? No, sir. Um, the FBI does publish, uh, and wh why is that? Well, I, I think the employees, I mean, our system doesn't look at skin tone and features. It's a mathematical computation that comes well, back. If we, and we, they're to look at the mathematical let features me, um, of the face. Okay, I understand that you're basically that de describing facial recognition technology, but outside studies have shown that there is a bias when it comes to certain populations, that the error rate is a lot higher. Were you aware that the ACLU conducted a, a match of different members of Congress that at an 80% confidence interval level and members of Congress, including myself, were mi mismatched positively with the mugshot photos? So the technology you're referencing to is an identification and that's a match. We do not do that. So you do just broader? We do two to 50 candidates back. Our employees look at two candidates or more. We do not look at one-to-one -one match. It's not a match. Okay. All right. Um, let's, the FBI publishes that it trains third parties in a manner consistent with the guideline and recommendations outlined by the Facial Identification Scientific Working Group. The Facial Identification Scientific Working Group does not endorse a standard certifying body of facial comparison to compare the AI-10 print certification exists for personnel that analyze fingerprints. These programs require hours of trainings before a person can be certified. Since there is no formal certification process that the working group endorses, what standards does the FBI require of personnel that conduct facial analysis? So we did um, publish, and, and our own employees in the face services have to comply with as well. We, we require all law enforcement entities that have access to the interstate photo system to, have, to follow the FBI's policy and implementation guide and the standards. They have to follow both. Gentlemen, time to expire. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Presley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been uh, abundantly clear uh, that facial recognition technology is flawed by design, unlawfully producing false matches due to algor algorithmic bias, including to everyday Americans, uh, and in fact, even members of Congress, which Representative Gomez uh, was one of those, and was just speaking to that. And there is growing, and I do believe credible, concern over the unauthorized use of this technology in public spaces, such as airport schools and courthouses. These systems could certainly be subject to misuse and abuse by law enforcement. Uh, and we know that this technology uh, is often used without consent. In that there are uh, no real safeguards, you know, there's no guardrails here. Uh, this is not fully developed. Um, I just want to take a moment to say that I appreciate the leadership of the city of Somerville in my district, the Massachusetts 7th, and Councilor Ben Uwen Campen and Mayor Joe Cardatone, who have um, uh, passed a moratorium uh, on this surveillance and on this software. Um, because of the fact that it is not uh, developed and there are just no so safeguards and no guardrails. Um, much of my line of questioning has already uh, been asked, but I did just want to pick up on a couple of things in the space of uh, consent um, because I, I wanted to just get some uh, accuracy questions and just better understand uh, for the purposes of the record here. Mr. Gould, do you keep data on how many people opt out of use for the facial recognition technology? 
Ma'am, I'm not aware that we're actually collecting data on people who choose not to participate. Okay. I don't think we're collecting it, no ma'am. Okay. And so you have no idea how many people have opted out of previous TSA facial recognition pilot programs? No ma'am. Okay. Do you know how many passengers were notified of TSA's use of facial recognition technology? Ma'am, the notification at the airport consists of signage and also verbal instructions from the officers. So if they're in a lane where facial technology is being piloted, I would say that 100% of the people are being aware that it's, it's being used. And they actually have to assume a you know, suitable pose to actually have the camera capture their image. So again, how can a, so if this is based on signage, I mean, which in many ways can be arbitrary, how are folks even aware of the option to opt out other than signage? And then how do they opt out? It's signage, it's announced. If you'd like to have your picture taken for your identification, you know, please stand right here. Otherwise, can I please see your credential, your, you know, hand carried identification? Yeah. Um, okay. And is that communicated in multiple languages? For the purpose of the pilot, ma'am, it has not been communicated in multiple languages. Okay. Um, again, just for the purposes of the, of the record, I guess I, I overspoke based on my, my own desires uh, that uh, the municipality in my district, the Massachusetts 7, Somerville passed an ordinance to ban, but has not yet passed a moratorium, so I just wanted to correct that uh, for the purposes of the record. Um, let me just, uh, for a moment, uh, just get back into some questions regarding government benchmarking for facial recognition. Uh, Dr. Romine or Dr. Goodwin, are you aware of how many government agencies use or possess facial recognition technology? I Dr. Romine or Dr. Goodwin or anyone? I, I don't know that answer. Nor do I. I. I do also want to put in front of everyone. So we, the GAO does have ongoing work right now looking at the use of FRT at CBP and at TSA. So we will be following up on the information here. Okay. And so, okay. So there isn't, is there a stabilizing, like a comparative sort of bench, benchmark uh, as to the accuracy of these programs and how they compare with other programs? We, we are not aware of that as of yet. Okay. Did, uh, NIST present any red flags to agencies about inaccuracies in any particular system used by a government agency that you're aware of? N NIST doesn't uh, interpret the scientific data in terms of red flags. We, uh, instead, we just ensure that uh, everyone who is using facial recognition technology has access to the scientific data that we publish openly about the performance of the algorithms that have been voluntarily submitted to our program. Okay. All right, I think that's it for me for now. I yield. Thank you. Let me just ask you this, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Goodwin. You said there's ongoing work. What, what, what's happening there? Yeah. So we have um, ongoing work um, at the request of both the Senate and House Homeland Committees to look at the use of facial rec face recognition technology um, at DHS, and in particular TSA and CBP. Mm -hmm. We also have um, ongoing work looking at the commercial uses of face recognition technology. And if I could just kind of circle back to uh, Congresswoman Presley's comment about consent. So, you know, there is the Senate bill um, that will look at consent, but it only looks at consent from the standpoint of commercial usage, not um, uh, federal usage. So we have those three, those ongoing jobs. And then GAO does have a request in to look at face recognition technology across the rest of law enforcement. Well, going back to Ms. Presley's uh, questions about the whole idea of language, um, do you all feel comfortable? I mean, I'm assuming that you've looked at TSA already, right? We're just starting that engagement. So we haven't. So you haven't looked at the pilot program? Not, not as of yet, but that, I imagine that will be part of what we examine. But that engagement, that work just started at GAO. And one of the things I'm hoping that you'll look at is that whole question. You know, people, people are in a hurry. They're trying to get to where they got to go. A lot of people don't even know what facial recognition is. They don't have a clue. 
put all the signs up you want. And, I, and, then, if it, it, and then if you got a language problem, that's even more, uh, Mr. Gould. It's something to consider. I, have you all thought about that? Uh, yes, sir. I was remiss uh, when I answered the question before. One of the reasons we're doing these pilots is to really assess the efficiency of how we communicate with passengers. Can we do it better? Can the signage be better? Multiple language in certain areas, is that something we should be looking at? All that will be assessed with respect to these pilots before we make a decision moving forward. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I got to tell you, and through the chairman, I hope this is okay. This stuff freaks me out. I'm a little freaked out by facial recognition, Mr. Chairman. I hope that's okay. I can see yeah, that. Yeah, it's okay. Way. Thank you. My residents in Michigan's 13th Congressional District have sub been subjected to increased surveillance and over-policing for decades. Currently, the city of Detroit rolled out real-time video surveillance program called the Project Greenlight in 2016 to monitor crime at late night businesses like gas stations and liquor stores. But now the system has expanded to over 500 locations, including parks, churches, schools, women's clinics, addiction treatment centers, and now public housing buildings. Without notice or public comments from residents, the Detroit Police Department added facial recognition technology to the Project Greenlight which means Detroit Police Department has the ability to locate anyone who has a Michigan driver's license or an arrest record in real time using video cameras mounted across the city in a da database of over 50 million photos. In January 2019, reports emerged that FBI had begun a piloting use of Amazon recognition, Amazon's controversial software that can match faces in real time video, similar to Project Greenlight. Recognition like real-time facial surveillance programs has dangerous high error rates for women of color as compared to white males. In the 13th Congressional District, residents will be disproportionately bear the harms of uh, face rec uh, facial recognition misidentification. So Ms. Del Greco, what policies does the FBI have in place regarding the use of real-time facial recognition technology? I heard claims that you, you, you all are not using it, but there, there is a pilot program, correct? No, there is not. For the Amazon recognition software, uh, to the best of my knowledge, and verified before I came today, yep. the FBI does not have a contract with Amazon for their recognition software. We do not perform real-time surveillance. The Through the chair, if I may, if you can produce that documentation and that information to our committee, I would really greatly appreciate that. We will do so. Now, can you explain how the FBI, so the FBI is not currently using Amazon recognition at all? We are not. Good. So in March 2017, NIST released a report in accuracy of facial recognition systems when applied to individuals captured in real-time video footage. The report found significantly higher error rates for real-time use of recognition with accuracy rates as low as 60%. So Dr. Romain, um, do you think that the use of real-time facial recognition technology is ready for law enforcement usage? That's a judgment that NIST is not prepared to make. That's a policy judgment that should be predicated on the best available scientific data, which is our position. Well, what uh, does your scientific data say? The scientific data uh, verifies that, uh, that facial recognition accuracy is highly dependent on image quality and on uh, the presence of injuries. Uh, the, both of those things can affect uh, the ability to, uh, to have So is there any viable solution to improving the real-time capabilities? You say I, I can't predict how mm -hmm. accurate the systems will be in the future as they continue to develop. Uh, currently, systems that use uh, facial images that are not in profile or that, that are not uh, straight on, like mugshot images, uh, or, or facial uh, images that are uh, indistinct or blurred have a much lower uh, ability to match. Dr. Goodwin, do you have any information about the inaccuracies? And I know that you all had uh, several recommendations, but can you talk a little bit more about my, you know, question in regards to, like, is this fixable? So in regards to your question about um, the Amazon recognition yeah. technology, that was not something that we looked at for the purposes of our report, so I won't be able to speak to that. 
Does so, but in regards to right now, the usage of facial recognition and accuracy, you all had like six recommendations about transparency and so forth. But, you know, I was just talking to some of my colleagues, like, how do you fix something like this where you dump so many innocent people into a database? I mean, the numbers are, I heard 411 million. I think I heard from you, 600 million people are now in this database that is being used for criminal justice purposes, which I'm not sure what this, what's the definition of that. So, kind of start a little bit at the beginning. So for the um, NGI IPS, there are 36 million photos in the, criminal, cr in the criminal part of that. There are 21 million photos for the civil part of that. And then as you look across all of the searchable da databases or repositories that FACE has access to, that's over 600 million. So that's, that's what I was talking about earlier. Um, the recommendations that we made, those three recommendations that we made related to accuracy, we feel like, you know, this would go a long way into helping DOJ better, um, 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 better ensure that the data that they're collecting, the way they're using the information, that that's accurate. Um, as of yet, as you've heard, DOJ has yet to um, close those recommendations, and we will work very closely with them to get those closed because the issues around privacy and accuracy are very important, and they're vitally important when you're talking about using this technology. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, through you, if it's possible, I, this is very important to, to my district and to others, if, if we can get some follow-up and confirmation that indeed the current administration is not, uh, does not have any pilot program going on with the Amazon recognition program. Thank you very much, Ms. Sully. What we will do, uh, I don't know if you heard me earlier, we're going to bring folks back in six weeks to, uh, to, to two months, somewhere in that area. And I'm hoping that before then they will have uh, those questions resolved. But definitely we will check back then. All right? Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the Fourth Amendment, our founding fathers endowed with us the right, quote, the right of people to be, to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fourth Amendment guarantees us that these areas shall not be unreasonably intruded upon uh, with most searches founded upon a warrant. And over the last few weeks, we've been hearing, whether from, from the private sector, the public, that we, we've heard about facial recognition technology being used in airports, protests, being purchased off of uh, social media, et cetera. Uh, Ms. Del Greco, you're with uh, the FBI. Does the FBI ever obtain warrants before deploying the use of facial recognition technology? The criminal mugshots are searched by our law enforcement partners, and all photos are collected pursuant to an arrest with a criminal 10 print fingerprint. And in use of facial recognition, it's beyond just the search of the criminal database, but scanning a person's face, I would say, is akin to searching their face in order to match it to a database. Does the FBI ever obtain a warrant to search someone's face using facial recognition? We do not do real-time searching. We okay. Do, not. do you require your external partners to obtain a warrant? I mean, they must do so with a, a criminal law enforcement uh, interest. Does the FBI use any information from any other agency? In, with respect to facial recognition? We, we share our records with other federal agencies with regard to law enforcement purposes. Uh, in our May 22nd hearing, Chairman Cummings stated that he was present at the 2015 Baltimore protests following the death of, Fe of Freddie Gray. At those protests, the Baltimore County Police Department allegedly used facial recognition technology to identify and arrest certain citizens present at the protest, exercising their First Amendment rights. Ms. Del Greco, has the FBI ever used facial recognition deployed at or near a protest, political rally, school, hospital, courthouse, or any other sensitive location? No, we have not. And, uh, and do you think that the, general, the generalized facial surveillance should be permissible? Do you think that that undermines the First Amendment? I do think that we protecting the, the American people is extremely important to us. The FBI absolutely wants the best, most fair system. We want to make sure that we're following the, the guidelines, process, protocol, calls, and standards that we put in place for law enforcement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. 
Gould, you're with the TSA. The TSA has outlined proposals to collaborate with private companies, including Delta and JetBlue, to develop and implement their facial recognition search systems. Is this correct? Ma'am, we've issued a security program amendment to Delta to allow them to use biometric identification at their bag drop. Mm -hmm. In terms of partnering with them, to develop the back-end matching system. That is something that we're solely engaged with CBP and on. And the bag drop, those are the computers that folks check in and get their boarding pass from? That would be the, I would use the term kiosk for that. The kiosk. Delta uses that technology at their kiosk. TSA has no equity there. That's solely to verify that mm -hmm. passenger has a reservation with Delta. Mm -hmm. Where we have equity is at our checkpoint and also at the bag drop where we're required to ensure that the passenger is matched to their bag. Do uh, individuals know that that is happening and do they provide explicit consent? Is it opt in? Passengers have the opportunity to not participate. So it's opt the, out, but not opt in. It is, yes ma'am. So, uh, so it's possible that JetBlue and Delta are working with the TSA to capture photos of passengers' faces without their explicit opt in consent. Ma'am, I was down in Atlanta last week and watched the Delta check-in process, the bag drop process, and it was very clear uh, while I was down there that passengers were afforded the opportunity, if you'd like to use you know, facial capture for identification, please stand in front of the camera and we'll do so. Mm -hmm. There was no automatic capture of passengers or anything like that. And, uh, and this capture is not saved in any way, but is uh, correct, right? No, man, the, the, the camera captures the image, the image is encrypted, it is sent to the TVS matching system, which is what CBP uses solely for the purpose of match, and then that match result is sent back to the operator. Is, is that captured image destroyed? It's not retained at all, no, ma'am. So it's sent, but it's not retained? It's not retained on the camera, no, ma'am. Okay. Um, could these companies in potentially be using any part of this process to either capture the algorithm or data? No, ma'am. I don't see that happening currently with the pilots that we're doing right now. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back uh, to thank, the chair. Thank, thank you very you. much. Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. When we had our hearing on May 22nd in this committee, there was an MIT researcher, Joy Bualamnini, who um, was testifying about data sets that NIST uses um, and that they may not adequately test for the full range of diversity that's present in the U.S. population. She said, quote, in evaluating benchmark data sets from organizations like NIST, I found some surprising imbalances. One prominent NIST data set was 75% male and 80% lighter skinned, or what I like to call a pale male data set, end quote. So Dr. Ramani, can you discuss how representative NIST data sets are when it comes to race, gender, and age? Sure, the data that we obtain uh, is from multiple sources. The largest amount of data that we get uh, First, I need to make a distinction between uh, data that we are releasing as part of the uh, ability for vendors to determine whether they are uh, able to um, uh, submit their algorithms to our system, to our evaluation process, so that we provide them with data for that. The rest of our data, the vast majority of it, is sequestered. Uh, it is not made public. It is solely for the purposes of evaluation. Most of that data is uh, FBI image data that we uh, sequester and protect from, uh, from release. Uh, there, are, there are some other image data related to Creative Commons, to uh, images that we have received uh, with full institutional review. Uh, that involves um, uh, permissions and then also um, deceased uh, data sets. In all cases, uh, if you look at the, the, the full suite of data, it is true that it is not representative of the population as a whole. Uh, however, we have a large enough data set that our evaluation capabilities can be statistically analyzed to determine uh, demographic effects of race, age, or, or sex. And, uh, and we're in the process of doing that now, and we'll release that report in the fall. So I, I gather that since the last hearing, you've been testing for differential error rates. 
on the facial recognition systems between races and genders. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the error rates of the algorithms that you tested between different races and genders? Sure. I can say a little bit of preliminary information, but I want to stress that the, the full statistical analysis, the rigorous analysis, is not completed yet. The report will be released in the fall that outlines the full uh, conclusions that we have uh, with regard to effects, uh, demographic effects, broadly speaking. Uh, we can say that there are uh, still remaining differences, even with the extraordinary advances in the algorithms over the last five years. Uh, there are still differences remaining that we can detect. Uh, we don't yet know whether those differences, whether it's with regard to race, sex, or, um, uh, or age, uh, are significant. We don't know yet until we've completed that analysis. So, I mean, you understand the concern. There's sort of two, at least two levels of analysis that we that are thematic here today. One is the threshold question of whether we like or don't like this technology, given the the general threat that it can pose to civil liberties. The second theme is whether recognizing that the technology is barreling ahead anyhow and is being adopted and applied um, increasingly um, across many different platforms, let's say, and uses, whether it's being developed in a way that ensures that when it's used, it's not being used in a, in a discriminatory fashion, it's not being applied unfairly, et cetera. And that depends on the algorithms being developed in a way that is um, respectful of accurate data. And we're not there yet, as I understand it. So it just increases the anxiety level. So we're going to be paying a lot of attention. I'm glad the chairman's going to have you all come back, because I think he, he's right that this is sort of a moving target here. We're going to be paying a lot of attention to how the data gets um, digested and how the algorithms that flow from that data um, are being applied, whether they're accurate and so forth. So we appreciate your testimony, but uh, obviously this is not the end of the inquiry. With that, I yield back. Sarbanes, um, the, a little while ago, um, we were told that the basis for a lot of these agreements between the FBI uh, and the states uh, were, well, the, the authorization was actually, and regulations or whatever, were put together before facial technology came about, when you talk about the moving target. So it wasn't even anticipating this, and we still haven't caught up. That's a part of the problem. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Um, appreciate the time and the, and the expertise that you, bring, uh, that you brought to this, uh, this important hearing. I think you understand that from both sides of the aisle, there's a real concern. And Ms. Del Greco, I appreciate you being here. I know um, I had to answer a lot of questions. But um, I, I hope you understand how serious I think everyone is uh, on this committee with, with this issue. And you gotta, I think you've got to understand the framework. I mean, you talked about strict standards in place. There were strict standards in place, at least people from our side of the aisle view it this way, strict standards in place on how we use, uh, on how people go to the FISA court and get information and put information in front of the FISA court. Uh, the Attorney General of the United States has tapped U.S. Attorney John Durham to look at potential spying done by the FBI of one presidential campaign. So this is the context and the framework that many on our side see this happening, and it's happening when GAO, not Jim Jordan, not Republicans, GAO, Dr. Goodwin said that when you guys started this, started using this, you didn't follow the e-commerce law, you didn't do privacy impact assessment like you're supposed to, you didn't provide timely notice, didn't conduct proper testing, and didn't check the accuracy of the state systems that you were going to interact with. So that's the backdrop, that's the framework. So when Republicans talk about we're concerned and working with Democrats, and I really do appreciate the, the, the chairman's focus on two hearings and now a third hearing, and looking at legislation that we may, we may attempt to pass here. Um, this is the framework. And so I hope you'll 
tell the folks back at the FBI, you know, we appreciate the great work that FBI agents do every single day protecting our country and stopping bad things from happening and finding bad people who did bad things, but the framework and the context is very serious, and that's why we, we come at it with the intensity that I think you've seen both two weeks ago in that hearing and, um, and in today's hearing. So again, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership on this, and I would uh, thank our witnesses again for being here. I, too, want to thank the witnesses for being here for almost three hours. Um, we really do appreciate your testimony. And of all the issues that we've been dealing with, this probably will receive the most intense scrutiny of them all. Um, the ranking member referred to the fact that we are bringing you all back, but we also have two subcommittees that are also looking into this because we want to get it right. It's just that important. And so I thank you. I, uh, without objection, the following shall be a part of the hearing record. Face recognition, performance, role of demographic information, scientific study, dated uh, December 6, 2012. Face off, law enforcement use of face recognition technology, white paper by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Jail priority open recommendations, Department of Justice letter to AG Barr, GAO. Opening ongoing face recognition vendor tests, part one verification NIST report NIST. Ongoing face recognition vendor tests, part two NIST report. Face and video evaluation, uh, face recognition of non-cooperative subjects, NIST report, coalition letter calling for federal moratorium on face recognition coalition letter and the coalition of privacy, civil liberties, civil rights and investor and faith groups including the ACLU, Georgetown Law, LGTP Technology Partnership and the NACP. Uh, I want to thank again our witnesses uh, for being here today. Um, Without objection, all members will have five legislative days uh, within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to, uh, to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. And I would ask that our witnesses uh, please respond as promptly as possible. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned.